Gospel Truth TV Business is how you can receive the godly advice to grow your business and leadership potential. Tune in Saturdays from 9 to noon Eastern to hear Andrew's friends share the kingdom principles that have helped them succeed. You can produce death with your words or you can produce life with your words. When you go into something like that and commit to be a finisher, you will see success. Learn proven business principles every Saturday from 9 to noon Eastern on Gospel Truth TV Business. My name is Rick Renner, and this is September 1st. And our gym today is called The Solution to Offense. In Luke chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus said, It's impossible, but that offenses will come. So we know from Jesus' own words that in life, there's always an opportunity to be offended by somebody. But what do you do if you're the one that got offended? And Jesus tells us in Luke 17, verse 3, and this is what he says. If your brother trespassed against you, Or if your brother violates you, if you feel like you've been wronged or you've been violated, here's the answer. Rebuke him or talk to him and then forgive him. Forgive him. Well, listen to what the word forgive means. It's a Greek word, aphiemi. And the word aphiemi means to dismiss, to release, to permanently send away so permanently that you're never able to retrieve that information again. It is permanent dismissal. Well, if you put something away and you can never retrieve it, never bring it up again, then you can't go there in any conversation or in your emotions. You have to simply put it away. And that's the command of Jesus to people that are offended, forgive or let it go. That's what I want you to think about today. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, God already had determined a purpose for your life, a God-given purpose. God has a purpose to train you in what you're called to do, and I tell you, Karis Bible College is the place for that. Man, if you want a life change, come to Karis. Come on to Karis! The next two to three years could be the most powerful time of your life. If you sit under the Word for four hours a day, for five days a week, for two or three years, I guarantee you, you are going to have God speak to you and start revealing purpose to you. Every one of you are created for a purpose. Do you know what that purpose is? Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're watching our Gospel Truth TV. I tell you, this has been a blessing. You know, if you are being touched by these programmers that we have on here, I would encourage you to support them. Did you know we don't charge any of the programmers? If you appreciate that, I encourage you to be a part of it. Join us, support Gospel Truth TV, and also support the programmers. Well, again, it's an honor to be back with you. Now, I'm not going to preach a sermon. What I was hoping to do, based on some discussions that Andrew and I and others at the table were having, was to share with you uh, some of my thoughts about what is going on in our country today and about race relations in general, uh, and then maybe to answer some questions. And I'm not sure how we're going to get that done, but but, uh, Richard is in charge of that, so I'm sure he'll work that out. Um, by the way, we ran out of DVDs on America from Divided Past to United Future, but I would encourage you to go to our website. You can download it. You can order the DVD because I don't have time to get into all that I shared during that speech, but I talked a lot about my, a, a biblical understanding of racial problems in America and went through a lot of history and a lot of of illustrations that help us to think differently than the way we have. Uh, One of the things that I point out is that we've been having a discussion about race in America now for as long as the country has existed. I mean, the fact of the matter is, and and you, you won't hear historians in colleges or universities tell people this, 
But the fact of the matter is, there's never been a time in American history when the issue of race has not been debated. When the first um, indentured servants and the first, um, I think it was 16 people who arrived here in 1619 were not slaves because there was no such thing as intergenerational slavery at that point. They came here the same way Irish did, the same way people from other parts of the world did. They came here as indentured servants. Uh, most of those people lived out their uh, time of servitude, usually about seven years, and then after that, they were set free, and the promise of, in, it, it varied depending upon where they lived, but the promise usually of about 100 to 200 acres was um, fulfilled, and one of the early people that Andrew and I have talked about um, it actually got his acreage, had his own slaves, and uh, ended, up, ended up in a very famous court case in which the first intergenerational slave was assigned that role by the court because he had attempted, according to the court, to cheat his master of the indentured time of servitude. Well, the slave master was black. So it was the first time lifetime servitude was ever implemented on the continent of the United States of America. It was a black man who sued to maintain a black man as a slave. So I, I get into all of that, which, again, is part of my thesis. It's not the skin, it's the sin. Uh, so I, I hope that you all will take advantage of that. Uh, there's a scripture that, that I want to share with you, you out of uh, the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, actually two verses. Um, and what it says is, beginning at the 14th verse, um, 14 and 15, says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Look carefully, or in other words, look circumspectly, be looking at things closely, examining things closely to avoid having any root of bitterness spring up, and that phrase spring up in the Greek suggests, or be blown up, or be, be magnified, so that by this trouble is caused and many become defiled, or to put it another way, contaminated with this bitterness. One of the questions that I'm often asked by uh, people and of all races and backgrounds, but particularly Christians, about the black community, for example, and its absolute seemingly uh, uh, cult-like devotion to the Democrat Party is, how, how can Christians... Support people who believe all this stuff and who support the things they support. How could they support a party that supports Margaret Sanger and, and, and hails Margaret Sanger as a hero when Margaret Sanger was a racist and elitist and, 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 and a genocidal maniac as far as I'm concerned, who really thought that she knew best who should live and who should die? I mean, who spoke before Ku Klux Klan rallies and and thought that Hitler really had a great idea about eugenics and, and keeping some people from, from living out their lives? That's Margaret Sanger who founded Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood. How can people support a party that is in league with an organization like that? How can they support people who are a party and, and people who support such unchristian, ungodly things? And I want to give you the answer. Of, of, of why this exists, and I hope help you to understand how we address it. It comes back to this. Look, the history of our country is very real. I mean, we can't pretend these things did not happen. What I try to do for people is put in context how they happen 
So, for example, I point out slavery was not unique to America, and people call it the, that peculiar institution, as if America invented it, created it, started it. <laughs> it. The fact of the matter is that slavery is a universal institution. It still exists today. It certainly existed in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, and it wasn't started by Europeans, or at least African slavery, the transatlantic slavery, wasn't started by Europeans. It was started by Muslims uh, in Africa, in northern Africa, who decided that sub-Saharan Africans made good slaves, and they sold them all over Africa and over the Middle East to people who could afford them. And when the Portuguese landed in Africa looking for gold, it was those North African Muslims who convinced them that they had a better business model for them than gold. Because gold was hard to dig out. Gold was hard to mine. But we've got a slave trade that you can make plenty of money after. And, and the Portuguese immediately saw the opportunity and introduced the rest of Europe to the African slave trade. That's how it started. But before it got started, the Barbary pirates, for two centuries before, were capturing people on the high seas, and they enslaved 1.5 million Europeans, put them in harems, put them in their armies. There, there were European slaves in Africa and the Middle East who had been captured by the Barbary pirates. So here again, it's not like slavery is somehow inherently racial. The racial aspect only got started because the Portuguese were introduced to African slavery. And over time, of course, mainly because of Christians, mainly because of Christians, what happens when conquerors subjugate people is they've always got to justify themselves. They've got to figure out a way to make this acceptable. Now, it's not always been necessary where you have despots who are in absolute control over others, but where you have a continent of people, many of whom are Christians, who read the Bible and see what it says and look at what you're doing to other people, those are the folks who are likely to say, hey, wait a minute, there, there's something inherently wrong with this. And so the racial ideology really became primarily a reaction to justify to Christians that this was really okay. Well, God intended it like this. You know, they, they, there's no better life available to them. And we're really doing them a favor. This is a good thing in the end. It's a moral thing. It's a right thing. And, and we, we need to try to be compassionate because after all, there's nothing else that these folks can do because they're not at the same level that we are. But from the time they arrived, Christians primarily were arguing against it. It happened in the 1600s, it was happening in the 1700s, and it was happening, obviously, in the 1800s. I mean, the Civil War didn't just spring up. I mean, you had the, 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 the Kansas-Nebraska Wars going on. You had uh, Preston Brooks beat Charles Sumner almost to death uh, on the floor of the Senate over an argument about slavery. So it's not as if the, the picture that the left likes to paint is, you know, slaves came to this country and all Americans just said, this is just great. We love this. Keep them in their place. But it's just not true. I mean, look, we almost weren't able to ratify the Declaration of Independence primarily because of the debate over slavery and whether it would include a denunciation of slavery. And there were colonies who said, if you, denounce, if you denounce slavery in the Declaration, we will not sign, mainly Georgia and South Carolina. And the same was true for the Constitution. There were states that said, if you, if you ban it, if you bar it, if you stop it, we will, not go, we will not go along. But the fact that those things were being said meant that there was a heated debate going on over this institution. And I always say, when people say, well, America's a racist country, I say, well, what about all the people who are arguing against it? Well, apparently they don't count. <laughs> Only the people who do count, which are the people who we believe were complicit in it. But there were a vast number of Americans who always thought it was wrong and always tried to fight against it. So the 
the idea that America is just an inherently racist place is just wrong. However, however, the reality of what happened cannot be denied and the wounds are real. And over the last four centuries, and particularly since, say, the end of slavery and then Jim Crow, the political advantage of having that root of bitterness blow up is absolutely irresistible. I mean, if I can keep people upset, about, quote-unquote, racial injustice. I can keep them, manipulate them to do exactly what I need them to do. And by the way, if, if, if I can, if, if, for example, when you have a, a, a guy like me who, you know, grew up in foster care, father had a sixth grade education, mother barely graduated from high school, um, grew up in the ghetto, and, and between my wife and I, end up with five degrees between us, raise a wonderful family, live, a, live, live a, 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 a marvelous life. When you have people like us springing up all over the place, then you've got to figure out, well, wait a minute, if racism is that bad, how does it happen that he's done so well? How does it happen that the Spike Lees and the Oprah Winfrey's and the LeBron Jameses of the world, the Colin Kaepernick's of the world, have done so well? Well... They are exceptions because the reality is something called systemic racism, implied bias, microaggressions that are just in the air. You don't have to prove them. You don't have to have any evidence of them. You don't have to have incidents of it. You just know it's there. And you ought to be angry about it. Spike Lee once famously said, any black man in America who is not angry is crazy. And here he is living in a mansion worth at this point, I think, about $100 million. He's got a real reason to be angry, doesn't he? So, but that root of bitterness is being exploited. So, I, so one of the things I say is, yeah, they... they they are caught up in a party that promises them some sort of racial justice, but it's not simply because of what happened in the past. It's because what happened in the past is being exploited. They're getting help, which is why telling the truth is so very important. Now, the truth is difficult to get across to people who almost have a kind of psychological or spiritual block, but you got to keep doing it because eventually it penetrates. Uh, I don't think whether it was you, Andrew, somebody was asking me earlier, do you ever see any changes in people? All the time. All the time. I go places and, and have black folks come up to me and say, and, 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 and I'm not exaggerating, folks, sometimes with tears in their eyes saying, and you woke me up. I, you know, I had a couple that told me they cried the whole way home because they said, we've, we've been voting against God and we've been standing against God because we were told that racially that's what we were supposed to do. And until you challenge that, we had never even thought differently. And some of the best friends I have. And I could go with example of exa after example of that. Now, not enough. But if you keep telling the truth, people are going to hear it. The truth has a power of its own. So that's, that's one thing. They're, they've got help believing the wrong thing. They've got help behaving the wrong way. And remember, Satan is in the middle of this. I remember one time I spoke to a woman who I considered to be a, a, a wonderful Christian woman. And, and I was about to run for office in Virginia. Some of you may not know. I ran for lieutenant governor, won the nomination there for the Republican Party. Ended up losing uh, that lieutenant governor race to our present governor, Ralph Northam, who went on to become governor. Um, and uh, I ran for U.S. Senate once, as, uh, a couple times, actually, many, many years ago. Tried it, didn't do very well. But that began the process of me in involving myself in politics and, and helping Christians to get more involved as well. Well, I was sitting in her office explaining to her I was going to run for office, and, and I had the same discussion with her that many of you probably have had, which is, how can you support a party? And I'll tell you, this nice little Christian woman 
the devil rose up in her. It was like the exorcist, let me tell you. I mean, I was expecting her head to spin. And she just looked at me and said, I've been a Democrat all my life. I'm always going to be a Democrat. I lived a Democrat. I'm going to die a Democrat. Not to put too fine a note on it. Not too long after that, she died of cancer. More committed, as I said earlier today, to the idolatry of a party than to fidelity to the God she claimed to serve. So, I mean, I, I've seen it. I know exactly what you're talking about. I was, I was campaigning outside of a grocery store one time, and a woman uh, came, she was, she was coming past me, and I said hello to her, tried to shake her hand. She happened to be a black woman. I sh tried to shake her hand, and she shook my hand. She said, are you a Republican? And I said, yes. She grabbed her hand back and said, I don't want to talk to you. I said, well, now, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute. Are you a Christian? I certainly am. I said, well, so am I. Don't you think God would want us to talk? No. And stormed off. So this root of bitterness, Satan's exploiting as well. And keeping people locked into and falsehood. Now, let me mention one other thing, uh, and then I think, Richard, if we've got any questions, we can go to them. This is the other thing, and most Christians have not thought through this, so I hope this gives you some food for thought, and you'll go do some thinking and research about this yourself. The reality is, is that we have a very, very strong Marxist movement in our country. We have got socialism and communism that is on the march and it's been on the march in America for 100 years. And people thought when the Soviet Union collapsed, we had defeated it, and we had not. Because we're now being reminded that China is a communist totalitarian country. And I don't know whether you all have seen this, because the media doesn't like to cover it. But in the last two years, we have had 20, uh, forgive me, I think, it's, I think it's 10. 10 people convicted of espionage for communist China. Uh, we have something called, uh, in Virginia, um, called the New Virginia Majority. It is a, an adjunct of the New American Majority, and the New American Majority is funded by communist front money. So this issue of Marxism's effort to destroy liberty is very much alive in our country. George Soros money and, and, and the money of, of other far left groups is coursing through our political system. And what these folks have come to understand is this. In America, where you have tremendous upward mobility and you have people who start with nothing and end up affluent or even fabulously wealthy, it's very difficult to make the classic Marxist class warfare argument. Because you say to people, you know, it's the capitalists, it's the owners of the means of production that are a problem, and the person looks at you says and, and says, oh, wait, wait a minute, I got a business of my own, what are you talking about? Or, or you look at a person and you say, you know, with those, those, those elites, those bourgeoisie, and the person says, well, wait a minute, my dad started a very successful company. What are you talking about? But if you can get people to divide on the basis of race, it transcends economic reality. So you can get the absurdity, the absurdity, of LeBron James comparing himself to Emmett Till, who was lynched down in Mississippi for presumably, allegedly, having looked at a white woman the wrong way. And LeBron James says, I feel like Emmett Till. You what? <laughs> I mean, you're a billionaire living in a mansion. You're famous. You, you're influential. 
You've got all kinds of privilege that the average person, regardless of race, will never experience. And you actually have the unmitigated goal to liken yourself to Emmett Till. But, see, that works. Because it's not based on facts or reality. It's based on emotion. And you can get, you can get some black person who is struggling to make ends meet Hear that coming out of LeBron James and say, yeah, I know what you mean, brother. They put graffiti on the side of his mansion, and you would have thought that the Ku Klux Klan arrived to lynch him. See, it, 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 race works because it's so imbued in this root of bitterness, and it's so emotional, and it transcends all economic realities. So you can get people who are successful in every measure to nevertheless view themselves as victims. When the first lady of the United States of America, married to the most powerful man, not just in the United States, but in the world, says, me and my husband get followed walking through a retail store. You kind of shake your head and go, oh, my goodness. I mean, really, you have reached the pinnacle of power and you actually view yourself as a victim that people follow walking through a retail store. But here again, the average person will hear that and go, you know what, I, I, I relate to that. I understand that. And so what we've got is something that is deeply entrenched in, 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 in our culture because it's got assistance trying to keep it that way, okay? And, and even the, the, the incongruity, the, the absolute irony of doing to quote-unquote white people what was once done to black people, which is this. You all know that the ultimate villain in America today, according to the cultural left at least, is the white person. Oh, and fellas, sorry, but if you are a white male, you are really persona non grata. And, but, and, and you know, we laugh because it, it's almost, it's so absurd, it's almost funny. But think of how evil that is. To actually dismiss a whole group of people because of the color of their skin. And to argue that there's something somehow inherently morally wrong with them. That essentially... Nothing can cure. And you're right back to really the communist solution, which is in order to create the kind of utopia we, we want, some people just have to go. Because they're incorrigible. They, 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 are, they are irreconcilable with the world we want to create. And so that's where you get the stuff, Andrew, people walking around, are you apologetic? Then get on your knees. Humiliating people like that is supposed to be somehow a mark of wokeness or liberation. But this is where we are. So, okay, that, that's where we are. What, what, what do we do? Well, I'm convinced there's really only two ultimate solutions to this. So before I get to those, let me just tell you what. You have to do, because you and I don't have the ultimate solution. What we have to do, keep speaking up for the truth, keep standing up for what is right, keep, keep talking to people, reaching out to people, praying, seeking God. In other words, don't pander to this stuff ever. Don't pander to it. Because I find some conservatives do that. They pander to it. And when you pander to it, all you're doing is perpetuating it. I mean, look, the reality is cops kill more white people every year than they do black people in confrontations with police. I mean, it's, it's, it's statistically verified by the Bureau of Justice Statistics and, and, and only somewhere between 200 and 250, and, and the numbers, by the way, have been declining of black men who, by the way, this is very unpopular, politically incorrect thing to say, black men, young black men, 6% of the population commit 52% of the murders. And no wonder they have more interactions with police. 
And no wonder more of them die at the hands of the police because some of them react violently and end up trying to kill cops and they end up getting killed in the process. That's, that's just the reality of it. But we just got to keep putting the truth out there and telling people the truth because that's all we can do and praying and asking God to open their eyes. But here, to, this to me are the two ultimate solutions that we have to, to, to believe God for. Number one, we need an awakening in America. We need an awakening. And we got to keep praying and asking God to do for us what we cannot do. Because look, you've got the entertainment culture, which is just pushing this stuff, just pushing it. And our kids are watching this stuff on the Internet. They're being inculcated with it, indoctrinated with it. How many of you have met people who had raised their kids, homeschooled them, treated them properly, taught them properly? They go off to some secular college and come home and suddenly you've got Che Guevara living with you. I've had parents say, Bishop Jackson, I don't know what to do. This is a different child than the one I raised. Because the social pressure of your friends, of the media, of entertainment, of your professor, of all your fellow students, sometimes of your church, you either yield or you become persona non grata. You start going along with the program. And so there's no easy solution to this. We need an awakening in our country that will, will infiltrate all of these areas of life. Because remember, it's not one thing that's doing this. It's a whole host of influences and institutions that are responsible for what we're seeing happen. I mean, I heard Don Lemon said on CNN, don't talk to me about riots. Don't talk to me about destruction of property. I don't want to hear it until there's racial justice in America. In other words, destroy all the property you want. Kill people if you want. Create all kinds of chaos out of people if you want. Because after all, we don't have racial justice in our country. And I haven't even gotten into that whole issue of what, what is America actually like today. But So it, it may be some questions will bring that. But here's the second thing. Every one of us, and I know he's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but every one of us better thank God we've got Donald Trump as president. I'm serious. Because while I know he's not perfect, he has stemmed the tide of this stuff. He has pushed back against it. He has made, this is why they hate him with a passion. Pray for him. Because look, I'm convinced that there are people in this country who would assassinate him if they could. And I don't just mean the, the kook. I mean, there, I think there are groups who probably sit around when they talk privately, think to themselves, if somebody just killed him, we'd be so much better off. Because they hate him with a passion. Because he got in the way of their plans. But I don't believe that Donald, and, and, and so by the way, Lord, we hope he gets reelected. <laughs> That's up to us. That's, we, we've got to be fully engaged. But here's what I also believe, and I'll, and I'll end with this and take any questions you have in the last few minutes. I really believe that we've got to have leadership in our country that will go after all of this. And the presidency is the biggest bully, pul bully pulpit there is. In other words, see, I, I believe that Donald Trump is a doer. He's a man of action. But I don't think that he's a sophisticated thinker about where our culture is and what it's going to take to reverse it. And I'm not saying that as a criticism. I just think he's the right person for this moment. But I do think we need, we need leadership that has kind of thought through this and understands you got to go after these universities. you got to go after the entertainment culture. you got to go after the public schools. you got to go after all of these influences that are trying to fundamentally transform America into some sort of secularist, socialist, atheist, uh, totalitarian construct of some kind, rather than preserving us as a constitutional republic. 
And so we need to pray for continued leadership because assuming that President Trump gets reelected, what happens then? Who, who comes along then? Because we could have somebody come along who ends up reversing all the progress that we made and what we needed is somebody who will pick up the mantle of action and then become, as I've often called him, will become educator in chief. That he will actually start educating the American people about our history, about where we've come from, about who we really are, about the lies that are told to our people. Yeah, Thomas Jefferson owned slaves, but I was just reading an article this afternoon as I was sort of resting and preparing up an article. I won't take time to read it to you in which he was talking about the insidious, the almost cancerous nature of raising children in a slave system and having them buy into the inherent implications of superiority and what that does to their young minds. Yeah, Thomas Jefferson. He was struggling with it. He was wrestling with it. But you won't hear that. All you hear is dismiss him. He's a, he was a slave owner. Life is a lot more complicated than the left would have us think because they have an agenda for us. And, and frankly, I still say, because we are the ones who know we need God, we are the ones who know only God can reverse this situation. God is ultimately looking to us to bring order and decency and honor and Judeo-Christian values and principles back to our country. I've talked more the, longer than I expected to, but forgive me for that. Let me stop there and see if we got any questions before I continue. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I think they're going to bring out some chairs and uh, a table here. So praise God. Do we have the uh, graphic that we can put up with the phone number uh, for questions? Y'all been blessed today? Amen. Praise God. <laughs> well, Bishop Jackson, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we've got a lot of questions here. Um, the first one that uh, you haven't already addressed here is, uh, why do blacks and whites still worship mainly in separate churches today? Well, you know, Richard, I think like, like everything else, it's a complicated uh, answer to a complicated question. I think some of it is obviously just pure demographics and, uh, you know, people um, tend to live in communities that reflect a certain demographic reality. They tend to choose those places to worship. Uh, so I think that's part of it. Um, people tend to stay with their historic denominational uh, or church connection. Attending wherever their family was attending, that's part of it. Or they look for a church that they think is similar. Um, I, I think the other thing, the other reason is that, you know, people are accustomed to certain style and different ethnic groups have different styles of worship. Um, so there's some of that too. I mean, I've had uh, a friend of mine told me one time, he said, you know, I now go to a non-denominational church. He said, but I have to tell you, I would sit in church and watch them play drums and play guitars, and I would think to myself, this can't possibly be God. This has got to be the devil. <laughs> um, because he was just raised where, you know, it's quiet and it's reverent, and, you know, you just worship God in, in, in peace. And, but he said, I finally came to realize I was wrong. So I think that's some of it. Some of it, obviously, is the historical reality of, of you know, people just being separated from one another. And here again, I don't think that's mainly it because I have, for example, a mixed church. I have people of different backgrounds in my church. I go now visit a lot of churches that do. Um, but I think the reality is there's still some people who hold this view that we ought to be separate. I think they're in the minority. But I'll give you an example. This happened to me four or five years ago. I'd spoken to a group. Um, I won't even say the state because I don't want to smear the state. But I'd spoken to a group in the state. And afterwards, I was talking to some of the ministers who had come to the meeting, and one of the preachers said to me, happened to be a, a, an American of the European descent, and said to me, man, I'd love to have you come to my church. I said, well, invite me. I said, I'd love to come. 
said, man, I can't have you come. He said, those people would run me out if I brought a black man to my church. And I thought, man, well, you need to preach, so you, you need to preach harder, brother. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so there is some of that. But I, but I think it's a complex issue. I, but here's what I would say also, Richard. I don't think we ought to be condemning ourselves because of the, 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 the ethnic nature of the church that we go to. In other words, oh, I go to a church where there's mainly white people. There must be something wrong with us. Or I go to a church where there's mainly black people. There must be something wrong with us. I think we ought to just seek the leading of the Holy Spirit and go where we think God will, will best use us. Because I didn't get to say this, but I saw, I'll say it now. See, I think what we as Christians need to be praying for is a nation in which we don't see each other by skin color. We see each other as individuals and as individuals only. So when I walk into a church and it's vastly majority Americans of European descent, I don't go, oh my goodness, wow, this is, this is not good. This is uh, something, something's clearly wrong here. I mean, I just preach <laughs> because these are God's people and God loves them. And, and you know, I mean, I don't know why the church is, has got the demographic makeup it has. I just know they're people of God. And I mean, for example, if you go to China and you visit an underground church in China, guess what you're going to find? Chinese. So I'll stop there. Now well, that's a revelation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've got a lot of questions. Let me see here. Uh, Bishop, here's one. It says, um, uh, do you think reparations would make black Americans feel like this nation is no longer a racist country or fix the race problem? No, absolutely not. I'm opposed to reparations because I think it's backward looking uh, and because I think it pretends uh, a simple answer to a very complex question. So, for example, Barack Obama, let's just take him as, as an example. I'm not picking on him. Barack Obama's father was from Africa. His mother was descent. What reparations does he get? Um, Bob Johnson. said so we need $14 trillion in reparations. He's a billionaire. What's his cut? I, I mean, it, it, just, it just gets to be ridiculous. What about all the West Indians who've come here since slavery was ended? And, and it just, it, it's, it's just unworkable, completely and totally and, and absurdly unworkable. But the other problem that I have with it, and this is a problem that I have with the whole so-called civil rights establishment and the so-called black leadership, there's no vision. The word of God says where there is no vision, the people perish. And when you don't have a vision, I mean, where, where, where are the people talking about not just an end to police brutality, but what about an end to the ghetto? What about an end to people living in poverty in the midst of gangs and drugs and violence and and, 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 and terrible schools that aren't educating children. What about an end to that? How do you end that? Where's the vision for that? All we're talking about is we got to end police brutality so that the kids who aren't getting, who aren't getting educated and are going to be tracked into dead end lives at least won't get brutalized by the police along the way. I mean, so my view is just like the election of Barack Obama didn't change a thing in terms of race relations in America, although some people hoped it would. In fact, I would argue it made things worse because of the ideology he brought to the table. Uh, I don't think if you paid out $14 trillion that Bob Johnson is talking about, uh, next week, it would not be long before somebody would be saying, but you know what? I didn't get my equal cut. I, and and somebody, somebody else would be saying, uh, you know, my family was in slavery, and their family wasn't. And so I should get more. And, 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 and a lot of people saying, well, that may, that may dealt, deal with the past, but it doesn't deal with the present. And the systemic racism that we all have to deal with every day, oh, it would not change a thing. And I just, I just pray that we'll get to a point where we put that garbage behind us and start trying to figure out how do we educate everyone
every child in America who's willing to be educated. How do we create safe uh, 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 places for people to live? I mean, in Chicago, among the 10 people, among the 50 people shot, one was a five-year-old kid. Two were teenage girls walking down the street. How do we create a society in which those kinds of things aren't happening? You know, so as far as I'm concerned, and my leftist uh, uh, detractors don't like this, but I really believe this in my own heart, my reparations was being born a citizen of the United States of America. As far as I'm concerned, I hit the equivalent of the lottery to be born a citizen in this country. So I don't think it'll help. Well, it looks like we've got just a few seconds left, so we're pretty much out of time. Andrew, do you want to close out? or? Okay. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you.
Welcome to AWM Now, your source for everything that's happening here at Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College. Devin and Jessica Grome came to Karis to get direction for their lives. However, while on their second year mission trip in Budapest, Hungary, Devin came to realize he wasn't truly open to what God had for him and learn what it meant to truly be a willing vessel. The one moment that I remember like distinctly, we were walking down the castle wall in Budapest and looking out over the city, I just remember thinking it wasn't in, in my radar to be a missionary. And in that moment, I said, God, I haven't surrendered to you. Lord, if you want me to move to this city, I'll do it. Today, Devin and Jessica are full-time missionaries in Hungary, ministering on the streets and in local schools. They also lead Karis mission teams into gypsy villages, bringing hope into the darkest places. Of course, none of this would have happened if Devin had never learned to trust that the plans that God had for him were for good. Before Karis, I, I didn't really have purpose. I'd given God my life, but only if it was convenient for me. So I really just started to understand that this God who loves me so much, whatever he calls me to, it's going to be great. God is doing something in this continent. He's changing hearts. We've been seeing you know, tons of salvations on, on the street, in schools. And I just shared with them the love of God. And God is a father who wants to know them. I really can't imagine doing anything else. And really, it's only because of God. He put me in a place that I love to share his kingdom, to just share the love of God with people. Thank you, friends and partners, for helping us raise up disciples like Devin, who are equipped to walk into the unique call of God on their life, even when it's to places they least expected. To see the full destiny story of Devin and Jessica Grome, click on the link below. A little girl grows back a missing piece of her heart. A drug dealer becomes an evangelist. A family buried under $60,000 in debt creates a business worth millions. These breakthroughs did not happen to seasoned ministers or Bible scholars, but to people who simply believed God's promises in the midst of the impossible. For 20 years, Andrew has faithfully taught the Word of God on television. As a result, we have been overwhelmed with reports of the miraculous, cancers defeated, debts demolished, autism overcome, destinies fulfilled, marriages restored, addictions broken, and healings of every kind. Our video testimony collection contains over 60 powerful stories demonstrating how anyone can access God's promises for themselves. For this reason, Andrew has made all of these stories available to you free of charge. To gain instant access to this wealth of inspiration, simply visit awmi.net, click on the Watch tab, and select Video Stories from the drop-down menu. We invite you to copy the link to each of our stories and share it as many times as you wish. Invest in yourself in a world desperate for life-changing good news. Travis Adams was born again in a drug rehab, but because he didn't have an understanding of grace, he lived his life afraid that God was mad at him. As a result, he found himself repeatedly going back through the same cycle of sin, that is, until he came across the free teachings of Andrew Womack. This is the grace encounter of Travis Adams. I started off with good intentions until I uh, moved into a house with a girl, uh, one of my friends, mutual friends, and we were uh, living together growing marijuana. And uh, laying on my bed, I just got frustrated and said, God, why can't I go to sleep? And the Lord spoke to me and said, Travis, you know what to do. And I said, God, I can't do, I can't do that though. I got, I got a harvest of marijuana coming up in a couple of weeks, you know, and I was looking forward to harvest, harvesting this marijuana and making a lot of money and, and things like that. But then the Lord spoke back 
to me. I mean, this was on the inside of me, so strong and clear. He said, son, you need to do this right now. And I just got up right off the floor and went and grabbed a few clothes and jumped in my car and moved out of that house the same day. Left everything I owned there except for a few clothes and moved back into the apartment with my mom. Um, I woke up in my mom's apartment and uh, I was just hungry to hear the word. So I was flipping through the channels and I came across Andrew uh, Wallet and he was just sitting at his table and speaking and I just recognized, I didn't, I just recognized this is a preacher and so I just stopped and I started listening to him. The truth is God's kind. You know, God is a good God. God's long suffering with you. God's not ticked off at you. God's not angry. He's not even mad. You know what? God's in a good mood. God likes you. And he just started saying things like, like God is a good God. And he's not mad at you. He's not going to kill you. And when he said that, the Holy Spirit just bore witness in me so strong. And I knew, I knew that God was, was speaking to me through Andrew. And I literally fell off my couch onto my knees. And while he was saying these things and just wept and wept. And I, and I felt the love of God. And I was instantly set free. Harris Bible College invites you to expand your vision. He finished his message, and Andrew started talking about his Bible college. I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit speak to me so clear, and he said, I'm going to take you to that Bible college one day. You're going to go there. I immediately took down the number on the TV, called the ministry, you know, got free tapes because I didn't have any money to give the ministry, so they sent me free, three free tapes. I, I remember looking through the list of all these different teachings and I was just praying and asking God, I was like, God, what else do I need to get from this ministry? And when my eyes came on spirit, soul, and body, they literally just became alive and jumped off the page. And that came to me. And man, when that got, when I heard that, it kept me from going back into, you know, God being mad at me or no, he's not mad at me or whatever, because it just, told me who I was in Christ. So after I got Andrew's teaching in the mail, I just started devouring everything he had. I just kept ordering everything he had. As Travis continued to renew his mind in the Word, he learned how to be more sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit, which became apparent when he began to hear a specific scripture repeatedly in his mind. And I didn't even know what it was, but it was, you shall not die, but live and declare the glory of God. And I finally went to my Bible study leader Steve and I said, hey Steve, God has been telling me all year long that I'm not going to die but live and declare the glory of God. I don't know what that means, but that just keeps happening. And he's, you know, said, well, try to find out, pray about it, ask the Lord what he's trying to tell you. A week later, Travis decided he would visit an old friend from his past, hoping to share his newfound faith. But on my way over to his house, I knew God was speaking to me and telling me not to go over there. I just knew it. I had a a check in my spirit, something was not right. And I honestly, unfortunately, kind of reasoned my, in my head and thought, well, God thinks that I'm going to get back into my old drugs and think, I'm not going to do that. Later that night, Travis became the target for a homicide, an attack from the same old friend that the Holy Spirit was warning him from visiting. He came over to my house and knocked me over the head with a crowbar, knocked me out, and then dragged my body back over into this field and laid me down in, in the grass and he continued to beat my head over over my head with a crowbar and left me in this field to die. Next thing I know, uh, I'm waking up in a hospital three days later. And that man that I had told the week before that uh, something's gonna happen to me but I'm gonna live through it, he was there with the doctors. And he looked down at me, this man did, and he said, Travis, he said, do you remember what the Lord told you? And I said that I looked up at him with one eye open and I had all these wires and hoses coming out of me. And, he, and I just, with all of my strength I mustered, I could say, I just said, I shall not die, but live and declare the glory of God. And then he looked over at all the doctors and he said, that man's going to be all right. Twelve days later, Travis walked out of the hospital completely healed and his attacker was arrested and sentenced to 12 years in prison. 
Through his local church, God began confirming it was time for him to go to Karis Bible College. Travis packed up his car and moved to Colorado to begin classes in August 2008. Being at Karis was, it was amazing. Just the things that God taught me, he really taught me how to live by faith because I didn't have the money to pay for school and next thing I know somebody's paying for my tuition and I don't even know who it is. I went through school and uh, maybe out of my own pocket only paid like two or three hundred dollars out of it. God brought in all the rest of the money. Travis began working in Andrew's phone center as a prayer minister. He also started working in the warehouse of Messenger International where he continues to work today. Packaging and shipping out materials by John and Lisa Bevere to be sent out all over the world. But John and Andrew were my spiritual fathers. To be able to work for both of them and be under both of them is, is an honor. The message of grace is something that has radically transformed my life. It wasn't until I got that message that I was truly set free. You know, if it weren't for partners, if it weren't for people that were sending Andrew, enabling him to get this message out, my life, would, I never would have heard of Andrew. I probably, I may not even be alive right now. As partners with Andrew Womack Ministries, you are helping transform the lives of people like Travis through the free teachings of God's love and grace. But I wouldn't be where I am today if it were not for the teachings of Andrew. I can't emphasize enough how powerful they are and what they've done for me. I will spend the rest of my life teaching and preaching what he's preached to me If there was a kidney transplant, she couldn't because her heart wasn't strong enough. A spoonful of food, she would throw that up. And I was just literally watching my wife just wither away. The doctors are trying to help, but they're failing miserably, and we just didn't know what to do either. And I just decided, I just said, Lord, in Jesus' name, I'm going to eat. Now that my wife hasn't had anything really to eat in eight, nine years, but she started consistently eating. I went back to see the doctor three months later and he was astounded. Viewer supported Gospel Truth TV is free to listeners and free of charge for your favorite teachers. This is what we're hearing from people just like you receiving these messages of God's unconditional love and grace. Your teachings are transforming my life. Thank you. And continue teaching the Word of God. I love, love, love being able to listen to truth and be encouraged anytime. Thank you for presenting the gospel and having teachings I can trust. I absolutely love this. Please keep it going. It is a real blessing to me. When you give to Gospel Truth TV, you're changing your life and touching countless others around the world. Click the Give button at the top or text GIVE to 719-301-2552. This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Good morning and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. That's me. I'm glad to have you here today. And I'm sure that, I don't know what time of day it is that you're pulling out. I always say good morning. Maybe sometimes I don't. But anyway, most of the time I say good morning, but it's got to be morning somewhere. You realize that. And so um, I do these in the morning. So somehow I just project that onto you. 
And I know that you're sitting around either the desk or maybe you're just, you know, sitting there in your easy chair and you got your notepad ready and you're getting ready to go through the Word of God. The nice thing about it is people say, I talk fast, but you can stop me when you're watching me on, uh, you know, a playback of some kind. So anyway, there's all types of things. That's on YouTube. I've got a channel on YouTube that you can watch it. You can archive. You can go back here. We have some archives. And I know that uh, Andrew Womack on uh, his station has uh, archives. So those are just things you can do to go back and watch them and hear them over and over again. What a blessing. And you can hear them over and over again because I'm offering this series on the importance of the word on a CD series. And the announcer will come on at halftime and tell you how you can have your copy for yourself. The past few days, this last week and also the first of this week, We've been talking about the importance of the word. We'll take it on through the remainder of this week. But we covered a number of areas. We talked about the importance of the word. Then we took the word of God and what it's important for. Number one, it's important for the uh, limitation of sin in our life. In other words, for growth. You have to grow into something and out of something. You grow into maturity where you sin less and shoot for the goal of never sinning again, which means on this end, you have to sin less. But what is the power that carries you through? Well, you have the Holy Spirit. Thank God for that if you walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. But on the other hand, you have the word of God. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. And these exceeding great and precious promises are given to us that by them we might be partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. The second thing we took up was the importance of the word of God and prayer and how that the most important prayers you can pray are prayers using the word of God or principles from the word of God. And so we took that up, how that prayer and the word going together is so important. The prayers that Paul prayed over the Ephesian saints took scriptural messages and context and put it into the prayer. And some of the best things you can do is even quote the word of God in your prayer. The Bible says to put God in remembrance of his word. Of course, he never forgets it. He likes to hear us say the word of God back to him. And then last of all, we took up the word of God and works. We talked about how that our works here in this earth are very important and how that uh, the word of God inside of us is what produces those good works out there that uh, the word of God has been given to us and so we can grow and so we can be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, Timothy tells us. So again, we find out how important it is and we are saved unto good works. We're not saved by good works, but we're saved for the end result of producing good works. And this is why God left us in the earth. Today, we're going to start taking up the word of God and obedience because uh, the word of God has a lot to say about obedience. And you can turn to our theme text, and that's Matthew chapter 7. We're going to take a look at verse 24 through 27. And again, I want to address those who are just partners with me, those who have put such a trust in me and believe me. When you become a partner with me, it's just an added weight onto my life, first of all, of the fact that you trust me and I need to make sure that this ministry maintains the credibility and also the the honestness of of producing the word of God and speaking the word of God. I wanna thank you for that. But next of all, it really increases my hope. I look toward the future and think, man, we can do this, we can do that. We can increase the number of stations. We can increase the quality here. All the different things we can put out other books. We can put out other CD series. All the great things we can do because partners help to make it possible. I've said this before, the number one reason why this ministry is successful is because of God. He's given me a call. He's given me a gift. And so that's the most important thing. Next of all is you. And you are the next important reason why. Because with God, number one, he is the one who's energized me. But you know, you're the one that supplies the natural needs. God works through you. God doesn't rain down money from heaven. There's times I wish he would, but he doesn't do that. He's not a counterfeiter. No, he takes the wealth that's in this world and transforms it into the hands of the just and transfers it through you. And I want to thank you again for doing that. So if you'd like to become a partner with me and join this great team of people, this great group of partners that have partnered with me and agree in, in my heart and also agreement with this ministry, that uh, you'll join in. So come to my website, bobyandian.com, and you'll find a place where you can become a partner with me. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. Here it says, For whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock, and the rain descended and the floods came. The winds blew and beat upon that house, and it did not fall, for it was built on a rock. And everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rains descended and the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house 
and great was its fall. Obedience is part of the word of God where we honor God. And obedience is different than good works. Good works are done before others as a witness to them. But obedience is what you do when you're in private, when there's nobody else around you. How do you live your life then? You know, I was talking to a man one time that was a traveling salesman in our church and he traveled. He said, I'm by myself all the time. He said, the temptations are out there all the time. He says, and the first thought that comes to you, well, my wife's not here. And you know, he said, my pastor's not here. My friends aren't here. He said, but I have to remember something. He says, God is here. You see, where we come back to obedience, obedience is between you and God. And obedience is that kind of thing to where, whether there's no accountability around you, you have an accountability through the word of God and what the word of God teaches you and you know through the word of God to have that obedience before God, that trustworthiness before the Lord. So this is more than your outward actions, really what this develops and shows is your character. Obedience has a lot to do with character and mainly has a lot to do with character. Good works have to do with those things that are seen by the public out here. And what above all is you don't want is for the public to see you out here doing such great works and, and those types of things, but behind the scenes, you don't really love the Lord. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is obedience. And your neighbors, yourself, these are your good works. The word of God backs these, promotes these, energizes these, and really gives us the ammunition to which we can use it in life. And so, again, none of these things should be done to earn God's blessings. We're not trying to be obedient to God to earn his blessings because, again, we come back to it. This is not by human works. Now, there are good works we can do, which are before people, energized by the Holy Spirit. But we even even then, we don't do this to try to gain the approval of people, have a pat on the back, nor do we try to get the pat on the back from God or the approval of God. We really are not out for that. Although we will get approval from God and we will get approval from people, that's not the main motivator in our life. The main motivator in my life is the fact I have just been what God asked me to do. I am doing what he asked me to do. And in that I have the greatest pleasure knowing that my life is counting toward other people for eternal reasons, not for natural reasons. A pat on the back is just temporary. Someone saying how great that message was or how great that help was, that's just temporary. But on the other hand, the things you do in the area of character are eternal. First Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22 says this, and Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken the fat of rams. What God is looking for is not just the fact that you sacrificially do things. What he's looking for in your life is obedience. Obedience is what we're looking for. And this is what, again, God is looking for. Obedience, he said here, is better than sacrifice. Sometimes where people are disobedient toward God, they'll turn around and try to get bigger offerings into the church. You cannot buy God off. They'll increase their church attendance. You cannot buy God off. God is not moved by human works trying to appease God when all God's looking for is a repentant heart and a heart that's back working with him for the good of the kingdom of God, the good of people knowing you're doing eternal things. And so again, oftentimes we as Christians, when we do something wrong, we switch to the same methods as the world. We just start piling on the good works thinking we can somehow browbeat God into this thing or we can somehow manipulate God into saying, oh, it's okay, okay, I needed that money in the church. God doesn't need your money. The church may need your money, but God doesn't need your money. God's looking for a, a contrite and a broken spirit before him. We should serve others from a strong hunger to desire to do God's will. Even what's behind my works is my obedience toward God. My attitude toward God literally is the mirror of what everything else is in my life. When I can look in that mirror and know I honor God and I love him, and so I'm obedient to him and whatever he does because I love him, that everything else seems to fall in place. I can minister to people for the right reason. I can minister in my church for the right reason. I can conduct my ministry for the right reason. Psalm 119 verse 155 says, salvation is far from the wicked because they do not seek your statutes. I want to be one that seeks God's statutes. This is really where honor comes from. This is really where obedience comes from. I desire to serve God. I desire to love him. I desire to do things the right way because why? I have a pure heart before God. I act toward the world like God would act toward the world. This is God in me coming through me as I take what's in me and bring it to the outside and let the world see Jesus Christ in me. As it said in the New Testament, I am a walking epistle known and read of all men that they look at me and they see the word of God. They look at me and they see the character of God. They look at me and see Jesus Christ himself. Knowing God and keeping his commandments are tied together. 
First John chapter two and verse four. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Wow, I don't think you get more blunt than that. You can say you love the Lord, but you really don't keep his commandments, do what he asks you to do, then you're a liar. Okay, and he's simply saying that. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And really, this is an expression of love. What is honor? What is respect? What are these things we've been looking at? Obedience, what is it? It's really an outflow of your obedience to God. It's an outflow of your love toward him. And this is where all things proceed from is from the area of love. First Corinthians chapter 13 simply says the same thing. If I do all these things and have not love, it profits me nothing. And I don't want to be someone who has no profit before God. I'm not seeking the profit, although it should come. I'm seeking the fact that I want to love God and love people and do it because of that. And God says, if you do that, then you will see the prophet. First Corinthians 13 and verse three says this. It says, though I give all my goods to the poor and even give my body to be burned and have not loved, it profits me nothing. You know, it's the only verse in that entire chapter that has the word profit attached to it. And it's attached to a verse on giving. God intends that giving profit you, but he doesn't want profit to be the motive of why you give. He wants loving God and loving people to be the motive of why you give. If you don't have that love, agape love, what is agape love? It's first of all toward God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, then people, then love your neighbors yourself. If that is your motive to love God and love people, then God said, man, stand back as you're gonna see the prophets start coming at you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Men are gonna start bringing into your bosom. God can trust a person who loves him and loves people. All God God's looking for is somebody he can trust. He said of Abraham, the reason why I want to bless Abraham is because I know he will be a blessing. Abraham was already a blessing and had very little to be a blessing with, very little money, very little property, but whatever little he had, he kept giving to other people. And God said, that's the indicator. I can trust him. When we come back from that, we'll take up from this particular place here. But again, I want you to have this series called The Importance of the Word so that whatever I'm teaching here, you can reinforce it while you listen to these CDs, either in your car, at the office, or wherever you are. Here's the announcer to tell you how you can have a copy for yourself. John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without the Word of God, our lives would be unstable and without direction. There would be no hope for believers or, for that matter, the entire world. In this seven-part series, Pastor Bob Yandian emphasizes and explains the vital necessity of the Word of God in the life of every believer. Sermon titles include A More Sure Word of Prophecy, The Inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God's Reputation, The Wisdom of God's Word, The Merchandise of Wisdom, Wisdom, Riches, and Honor, and Jesus, Our Wisdom. To order Importance of the Word, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life, through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Pastors, if you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite. All right, let's continue on. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, the Lord says, Why do you call me Lord and do not do the things that I say? Who we say we are and what we do are tied together. How many people do you have that that say a good testimony, but their life doesn't add up to it? And they simply excuse their lifestyle and say, Well, you know, what's important is I'm a Christian and my intentions and motives. Listen, intentions or motives are good, but on the other hand, you have to fulfill them. You know, well, I intended to do that. Well, then, you know, why in the world did you just not do it if you intended to? In other words, the Bible talks about the thoughts and intents of the heart. Then we're to take those intents and act on them. You know, I think intentions sometimes say, well, I intended to do that. That was the leading of the Holy Spirit, prompting you to do it, but you just disobeyed the Holy Spirit. So again, it comes back to it. How can you honor God? 
And how can you be so obedient to him and say you're obedient to him when Jesus said again, this verse of scripture, Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord and do not do the things that I say to you? So again, really went on to say later, if you love me, then keep my commandments. Because if you keep commandments out of love, they're not really commandments. They're just part of your lifestyle. You know, if your ask, wife asks you to do something and you love her, then you should do it. If, if your husband asks you to do something and you love your husband, then why don't you just do it? Again, if it's not sin, they're just asking you to do something. Why do you gripe and complain? You really don't love them. That's the whole bottom line. Oh, you might love them a little bit, have appreciation for them, but that real kind of love where you put that person above yourself is not there. The Lord is asking you to put him above yourself and then next of all, put other people above yourself. He said that in the word of God. And so there comes a time we just simply realize, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, which is obedience to him, and all these other things will be added unto you. I trust in all this that you're really taking account of yourself. As we keep moving on, I'm just stopped here at this point right here. But really, you know, as I keep teaching, there comes a time you need to stop and reflect. You know, David did that during the Psalms. He would just stop and say, Selah, think on what we have just said. Think, meditate on it. Not only is the word of God to be studied, but it's to be meditated on. When the revelation of it comes to you, then meditate on that revelation. You can meditate on a verse of scripture. But what I have been teaching throughout this first part of the broadcast simply comes back to this. It's time to take an account of yourself. Do I really love God? Or do I love other things in life more than the word? Well, you say, well, how do I know which it is? Which one occupies most of your time? You know, do you spend more time, you know, studying God's word, praying and looking for spiritual things and maybe going through a CD or something like that to learn from that? Or do you spend more time listening to a certain type of music? Do you have the music going all the time when you're in your car? Uh, do you spend a lot of your time with, with, uh, with magazines and newspapers and other publications besides that? It was said of Smith Wigglesworth that if you ever walked into his house and you stood there at the front door and, and you had something in your hand, such as a London Times or you had a magazine, he'd say, drop the drop the paper, come in the house. If you ever question him, you say, I do not allow anything in this house except Bibles and books that surround the Bible. And that's why he did. Look at the impact he had. Perhaps it's time we look at our life and reevaluate. God is not asking us to throw these things totally away as Smith did, but he is asking us to put a limit on all these things. And this is why we have temperance in the Christian life. The Bible does not have a gift where you just actually put things away and you abstain from. There is no gift. There is no gift of abstinence. There's no fruit of abstinence, but there is a fruit called temperance where the things of this life that we have that are good, they're not sin, but they become a weight in our life and that they have become so weighted down because they occupy so much of our time. And when you get to heaven, you'll look back on it and think, you know what? It didn't do me any good. Only got me a little bit interested for a moment. I went on the next day because why the news changes tomorrow. But the word of God lives and abides forever. What we're talking about here is the importance of your character. We're talking about the importance of obedience before God. And the world can see that coming through because you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Then you love your neighbor as yourself. With God, number one, and seeking him, number one, you can't help but love people. It cannot help but affect your life. Think about that and meditate on it. Perhaps by the end of this broadcast, you're going to start before God and you're going to start saying, Lord, I repent of that. I've been letting things occupy my time. They're not sin. They're just wasting my time. And I need to spend my time because the one thing I have on this earth that is so precious as a Christian is time. And every second is lost. Every time it goes by, it's lost. What have I done with that last second? Perhaps it's time I start looking at time as a gift from God and understanding I need to spend more time with him. Let's go on. Obedience is no option. There's no option in the word of God. Well, you can be obedient or you cannot. God said everything revolves around that obedience to him. We're not to come to church, receive the word, and then do nothing. No, God has asked us that to become doers of the word of God. And part of the doing of the word of God is to be obedient to the Lord your God. Obedience comes to the fact that you know you can trust him. He'll never ask you to be obedient and then miss and then hurt you. Again, we hear the word obedience. That's often mean, even being taken out of the uh, wedding vows today is to be obedient. You know, we're to, we're to honor them and all that, but not to be obedient. Because you know what? There's so much stuff 
up in this earth today where people abuse people, make slaves out of them. And that's not, that's what not what obedience is. We are not slaves for the Lord where he comes to us and beats us and makes us do certain things. If we are a slave to the Lord, we're a love slave. We just simply put before him, so Lord, I want to be your servant. And guess what? God takes really good care of those who simply say, Lord, I want to be your servant and I want to obey you. And I want to have in my life that obedience toward you. And this is, again, what builds character in you. And then also builds that testimony that God wants for the rest of the world. The blessing comes from being obedient to the promises of God. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, which we already covered, talks about the fact we're to build our life on the rock. And the rock is the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God. The word of God is Jesus Christ himself. The word of God is the mind of Christ. And as we study the mind of Christ and learn to think like him, then we love God and we love people. And again, this is where obedience comes from. James chapter 1 and verse 22, I already quoted it, but not only be hearers of the word of God, but be doers only. Oftentimes we come to church, we hear it, and we hear, you know, a pastor preach something. We hear a, 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 one of our famous, our favorite teachers, and we, we enjoy that. You might listen to this broadcast. Well, that was really good. But are you making it a part of your life? Are you going to do it? Because to be a hearer does not bring the blessing. It's being a doer that makes the blessings of God come into our life. There's a divine discipline for not being obedient to what we know. Luke chapter 12. Verse 47 and 48 says this, the servant who knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, nor did according to his will, will be beaten with many stripes. But he who knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes, for to whomsoever much is given, to him much will be required, to whom men have committed much, to him they will ask the more. God is not comparing himself here to an evil taskmaster that will beat us. He simply is making a contrast. The book of Luke, really most of the uh, parables that are taught there and stories are taught there are not comparing God, but contrasting God. This is how evil men do it. This is how God does it. There was one parable of the woman and the unjust steward. She just kept knocking at the door, knocking at the door, knocking at the door, knocking at the door. Try And finally, this unjust judge got out of bed and finally did something for her because she was so persistent. And it was simply saying, that's the way men are. God is not that way. Asking you will receive, seeking you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. This is what he was simply saying. With God, you can trust him. What he says he will do, he will do. God is saying this is the way that it works in this natural world. But there is an analogy here that when we don't do what God's asked us to do, then we're out of fellowship with him. We're opening up ourselves to the things of life. And God is simply on the other side. And through his convicting power is telling us to come back right with him. Much like the prodigal son who left the house, was laying out there in the pig pen. He was out there and finally it says he came to him himself and said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home and I'm going to say, I have sinned against you, Father, and I've sinned against God. That's what God was waiting for. But Lotus, the Father was there lovingly waiting on him. My Father is lovingly waiting on me when I'm out of fellowship. He will not come out there in the sin and join me. He wants me to walk back in to the light of righteousness and righteous living. Because I'm a child of God, I'm out of fellowship with him. I'm a child living among sinners and acting like sinners. And God said, it's time to repent of that and come back home. And so he said, you're asleep among dead people. You need to wake up and you need to rise up and come back into fellowship with the Lord like the prodigal son did. He came back home. That's where the father is. Why? Because Jesus walks in the light. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other. The moment I sin, I walk out here into the darkness. I'm not in the darkness of losing my salvation. I'm in the darkness of walking out of fellowship with God. The light is the light of righteousness and righteous living. And the Lord wants me to simply confess my sins, come back in and be back in fellowship with him. So this is what Luke has to say. And perhaps the missing part of your spiritual growth is obedience toward God. Second Timothy chapter three and verse seven says this, some are ever learning, but never come to the full knowledge of the truth. Are you one of those? You come to church a lot. You listen to a lot of CDs. You go to services and stuff. You hear all these things, but you never really come to the full knowledge of the truth. Where does the full knowledge of the truth come from? It comes from being a doer of the word of God. Once you hear it, you make up your mind, I'm going to do it. That is obedience to the Lord. Taking that ear and ever making it uh, pull down into the word of God. The Bible talks about when it comes to healing, 
that you take his word and set it ever before your eyes, ever in your ears, ever in the midst of your heart. So shall be life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. He says, incline your ear unto my teaching. There's, listen, it's one thing to listen to it. It's another thing to take that ear and pull it down and say, today we are going to study God's word. And today we're going to meditate on God's word. Today we're going to be obedient to God's word because you know what? As I consider the word, that's how I consider God because the word is the word of God. You can take his word. You know, when a person shake hands and say, I'll put my word on that. My word on that means my entire character backs this up. And this is what God says. God's entire character backs up the word of God. When God said he's not a man that he should lie, he cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Next of all, where other men can let you down, he will not do that. Where other men back there in that particular parable were beating people. God says, I'm not like that. You can learn something from that. You can look at the way people are and understand I'm not that way. And, you know, the Lord wants us to do that, but we get everything from the word of God, being a doer of the word of God. It simply comes back to this. What I've asked you to do today is simply take an account of your life. Is obedience toward God the most important thing in your life? Perhaps that word obedience just throws up flags in your life because you don't like that word because it's attached to slavery or, or mistreating people. God will never put you into slavery as men put people into slavery. You can be a servant of God, but he's greatly rewarding and will take care of you. And so again, God does not abuse you. No, God is not an abuser. He cannot do that. But God's there prodding you and pushing you through the word of God to keep increasing, keep increasing, and keep increasing. In other words, the further you go with God, the less options you have. But the greater the happiness, the greater the joy, the greater the contentment, the greater the reward as you walk in the rewards of obedience. If you be willing and obedient, then you'll eat the good of the land. God just simply says, be willing toward my word, be willing toward my commandments, but next of all, be obedient toward them. And you're going to see the abundance of this earth come to your into your own hands because the meek shall inherit the earth. Those are the teachable ones. The teachable person shall inherit all these things in the earth. Be sure and get a copy of this. The announcer will come on and tell you, and I'll see you tomorrow at this same time. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without the Word of God, our lives would be unstable and without direction. There would be no hope for believers or, for that matter, the entire world. In this seven-part series, Pastor Bob Yandian emphasizes and explains the vital necessity of the Word of God in the life of every believer. Sermon titles include A More Sure Word of Prophecy, The Inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God's Reputation, The Wisdom of God's Word, The Merchandise of Wisdom, Wisdom, Riches, and Honor, and Jesus, Our Wisdom. To order Importance of the Word, visit our website at bobbyendian.com. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobbyendian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian. Ready to get more out of God's Word than ever before? We gladly announce the newly recreated Andrew Womack Living Commentary. Study with Andrew from Genesis to Revelation. This living commentary is packed with a lifetime of Andrew's own footnotes on over 32,000 verses and counting. This extensive living commentary contains multiple translations of the Bible, including the King James Version Plus, along with Strong's Concordance, where you can find the original Greek and Hebrew text. Andrew has also provided you with several historically respected commentaries. It's never been easier for you to study through the Bible with Andrew. Priced at only $120, this continuously updated living commentary is now available exclusively as a download for both Mac and Windows at awmi.net.
Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're watching our Gospel Truth TV. I tell you, this has been a blessing. You know, if you are being touched by these programmers that we have on here, I would encourage you to support them. Did you know we don't charge any of the programmers? If you appreciate that, I encourage you to be a part of it. Join us, support Gospel Truth TV, and also support the program. Karen Conrad serves as Vice President of Wealth Builders. She is a consultant, teacher, author, and maintains a successful real estate and home staging business that has been featured on the Lifetime Television Network. Welcome to Living with Karen Conrad. Hello, I'm Karen Conrad. Thank you for joining me today. And this is the second program in a series called Launch into Success. This is one of those areas that the Lord's really been speaking to me about. And I believe if you are watching this, that this is going to really help and speak into your life as well. We have seasons sometimes that, that they change and it can be confusing or wondering like, Lord, am I missing you? Uh, yet there's something so stirring on the inside, or maybe we're a little uncomfortable. And it's because God wants to bring us to that next level of success. This also is going to help you if you're someone that maybe change has been difficult, or maybe you haven't chosen change. It's kind of just come upon you. This is going to help you to deal with and walk through that change with the heart and the character of God. One of the things we covered in the first program is Matthew 6:33, and I encourage you to go back and watch that first program. Uh, this is in the Amplified with Matthew 6:33. The Lord just reminds us in this that as we seek and strive after him, and in the Amplified it says his righteousness, which means his way of doing and being right. And he particularly mentions attitude and character. And he says, then all these things will be added unto you. Uh, so that's our foundational scripture for approaching our success. It's staying close to him, knowing that as we walk through the steps that he's put on our heart, we maintain his righteousness. You know, the world has a way of doing and being right. But the world's way of doing and being right is not the way God sees us doing and being right. The way that we do things right is walk in his word, his attitude, and in his character. And that can cover a multitude, of course, of areas. But it also gives us confidence. Do you know what? God doesn't require us to be perfect. Praise God, because I am so far from perfect. But he does look at the heart. And what do we mean by that? It means, am I trying to please him? Or am I trying to follow his word? Is my heart towards God, right? So it's kind of like where you look at your child, like when they're a baby, you know, like Levi, of course, our children are all so cute. Nice to remember Levi as a little baby and often think about as I look at him now, like what he was like when he was one and two years old. And you know what? He was so adorable. And uh, which you think of your children too, right? Or grandchildren. And we know like our children's hearts are just, we know that they're so precious. But you know, there are times where maybe he, he didn't look so cute or precious to others or even to me. Maybe there's behavior that we looked at as like, oh, but you know what? We know our children's heart and we know their heart is good. I didn't require Levi to be perfect. You don't require your children to be perfect. So that's how father looks at us. He sees our heart. He's like, aren't they cute? Aren't they adorable? That's my girl down there. That's my boy down there, right? But we might be doing and acting in ways where maybe it's not such a great behavior. But when our heart is for him, we have ears to hear and we are correctable, right? Just like when you correct a child. Like with Levi, he had such a, a sensitive um, nature about him. You know, we didn't need to spank Levi. Uh, I got spanked when I was a child, but we didn't need to do that with Levi because just us like saying, you know what? You need to switch gears here was enough for him, right? He wanted to do 
what his mom and dad thought was best for him. It was an attitude of respect and honor towards us. And so he was very easy if he got off path over here, very easy to get right back on track. Well, that's how you and I are when we are living out Matthew 6, 33. We are not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. But when our heart is about striving after him and doing and being right in his eyes, right? Then even when we get off track, he can bring us right back on track. So praise God, we don't have to be perfect. Amen. All right, so where uh, we left off last time too is we started to cover five areas that we're going to go in more detail on today in this program. But when we learn to shift gears or get ready for that next level in that new season, um, you know, something that God's calling us to a higher level with, maybe we're ready for promotion, or maybe we're in a situation where our children were home and uh, now they're off to college or they're on their own. And so what was a priority in the season when they were growing up? Uh, you know, they're on their own. So God's going to have a new season for me. It doesn't mean we stop being a mom or a grandma or an influence. But when the children aren't home, there's something else that's going to fill our time, right? So maybe it's moving into that sort of a season. Maybe you've come out of this pandemic uh, you know, where maybe you don't have a job right now, or maybe you're even in an industry that, that may not exist post COVID-19. That can actually be very unsettling unless you understand what we're going to be covering today. So it covered five areas, uh, at the end of the show, we're going to go in more deeply. Um, so the first one is to transform our minds. When we look to shifting into success or into that next step, we have to be open to what the Lord is speaking to us about transforming our mind to the word of God. God thinks bigger than we do. He even tells us his ways are not our ways, right? And that's not saying an insult to us. It's just saying that he's God. He knows all things, right? So the way that he looks at things are not going to be the way that you and I would naturally look at things until we transform by renewing our mind and thinking big like God thinks. Fear not equals trusting God. And uh, I have a whole series on this called Fear Not because <laughs> it was just something I really struggled with early, um, earlier in my life when my first husband passed away and I was a single mom, fear just gripped me. And I knew that, you know, if I don't deal with this, because God tells us how many hundreds of times in the Bible to fear not, if I didn't deal with that, I knew that there was no way that I was going to be able to move out of the situation or the oppression or the, the scary feeling of being a single mom and a, and a widow. I wasn't going to be able to move out of that unless I got fear out of my life. Right? So it's going to be really important. And we'll talk about that in this series as well. Psalm 23, 7, it says, your steps are ordered by the Lord. To me, that just gives me confidence. Sometimes things in life don't make sense. Okay. Uh, it doesn't make sense when we run into struggles or, or maybe if our job ended and we weren't ready for that job to end. It doesn't make sense. So the confidence that we can have is our steps are ordered of the Lord. So God does not cause bad things to happen, but God knows what is ahead of us. And he is ahead of us ordering those steps. So as children of God, we're able to seek him and follow his voice and know that he's got this whole path laid out. So what I'm sort of seeing here is, you know, when you walk through maybe um, a river area, or you're going fishing, or when we were kids, we would walk across the Mississippi River. Those of you that grew up in Minnesota or visited Minnesota, you know what I mean? And there was these rocks that sort of went across the river, okay? And you had to know to step on that. So it was that path was laid out before you to get across the river. Well, that's a really good analogy for us to realize with the Lord. So even though we may not see all of that path ahead, we can be confident that our steps 
have already been ordered by the Lord. And it's our job to step from one place to the next in faith and in trust. And we know that at the end of that is going to be success. Deuteronomy 8.18, power to create wealth to confirm the covenant. All right, to expand the kingdom. And we're going to talk more about that as we go through here. It's really, really important we understand that. And then Isaiah 43, 19. I talked about this in depth in the previous um, program. I am doing a new thing. The Lord is doing a new thing in our life. He says his mercies are new every morning. He's got things ahead of us that are new. And those things can sometimes cause us to want to shrink back because we are not fully equipped for it. A lot of times I'll see people in businesses that they know God gave them a business and they that God gave them an idea. They're absolutely certain of it. And then two weeks later, once they kind of understand what it's going to take to get that business going, it's like they're questioning if they heard the Lord's voice. And the reason for that is, and we'll cover this in more detail this week too, the reason for that is once they got into understanding what it's going to take to do what God put on their heart, we start to take those things in and we look at ourselves to complete them. And we won't be completing anything in God's will without his help. That's part of being a child of God is that he walks alongside with us and he wants to help us. And together we're able to achieve success at a much higher level uh, than we ever would dream or be able to do on our own. That's part of the fun and the adventure of walking with the Lord. So where does this all start? You might say, Karen, all right, I'm ready. I want a new season. I want to go to that next level of success. What's my first step? Well, this is where it all starts, is a heart-to-heart -heart connection with God. So let's read some scriptures to set a foundation for this. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life that we know him. That doesn't sound that complicated, does it? Sometimes we look at things and we see so many complicated steps to be able to grab a hold of eternal life. Or we've been in churches, brought up in churches, or have been to church services that make us feel like we have to clean ourselves up before we are worthy to have eternal life with the Lord. And that's not the way that it works. We give ourselves to the Lord. We put aside all of our shortcomings and in faith, we just receive that he loves us and he wants us to be successful. And in this verse, that's what eternal life is, right? To know God. And in that, once we make a decision to walk with him, we don't have to be overly concerned about all the steps, all the requirements, all the impossibilities that seem to go before us. Because if we stay close to him, he's going to show us how to get through those. There's a really awesome praise song about him being a way maker. And in the scripture that we covered, um, and I'll touch on this again, he says that he'll make a way in the wilderness for us. And if we are looking at something and thinking it's a wilderness, what that's saying is that this looks impossible. And he's like, it is possible with me. And the quality of life that Jesus offers is very clear in John 10.10. 10, and it is a good quality of life. God wants us to be prosperous in every area of our life. He is a God of health, not sickness. He is a God of wealth, not poverty. Anything good is from God. Anything bad you can know comes from the enemy. And that in itself, understanding that and not having to sit and question if COVID-19 came from God. No, it did not come from God because God is not a God of destruction. He is a God of life and life more abundantly. I look at it this way and it sounds very simplistic, but sometimes I have to just remember this. God is good. The devil is bad. 
So anything that comes my way that is bad, I know is not from God. Whew, that's awesome because if I have a God that's bringing bad things to me, it's going to be pretty difficult to trust him. And he's our father. If we have a father bringing bad things our way to teach us a lesson, right? That would be very difficult to trust that that, that father has our best interests at heart. But our Father God is a good God, and anything that He brings to us is going to be for our good. And He is not into destruction, sickness, disease. He is none of that in Him. So He would not be producing it because it's not even in Him. Amen? That's good news. I think somebody needed to hear that today. And then I glorified you on the earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. This is Jesus. So how did he glorify God on the earth? He said he accomplished the work that God gave him to do. When the Lord gives us work to do, as I mentioned, that could be work in our home, that could be work in a business, that could be work in a ministry. Whatever the Lord has put on your heart to do for work, it is something that glorifies him when we do work in his attitude, in his character, and as he calls us to do. And even here, Jesus described it, that the, he glorified God, his father on the earth, having accomplished the work that God gave him to do. So I'm going to spend the rest of today sharing with you the process of receiving the idea, receiving what we'll call the envelope, right? The invitation from the Lord to go into that next level of success or in that next season. And I'm going to break it down and show you what that process looks like. Many of you have listened to my uh, Living Your Purpose series, and if you haven't, I would really encourage you to watch that. I actually have it out on my YouTube channel uh, that you can watch completely free. You can go to my website. I have a Discover Your Purpose test. One of the things that really helped me to go to the next level, matter of fact, for me, this, my life just like catapulted. It just took off once I got an understanding of my purpose in the Lord. And I'm not talking about my purpose being a job or a position, but how he designed me, how I am to approach work in a way that makes the best use of his gifts and talents and also brings me the most joy and protects me from finding my identity in whether my boss or the people I work for think I do a good job or not. I had to be free from man's approval. And while there's a lot of things we can do to get fear of man out of our life, one of the most effective ways is to know what God has designed us to do and what purpose he's created us for because he has made us special. He has created you and I as individuals that are not like anybody else. So the world tries to get us to think like for us to be successful, we have to look like the world or this movie star or, you know, this billionaire over there, whatever it might be. But God has created us uniquely based on the gifts and talents that he's given us. And my definition of success for my life is going to look different than yours. Okay, so be free from looking at other people and thinking that there is success and you're a failure or God's given them a better uh, purpose for their life than you. It's just, it's just not true. Our success, our greatest success in life is back to that Matthew 6, 33, is just strive after, aim after his righteousness and his way of doing and being right. And in that, that's doing the things, the, the purpose that God has designed us to be. Um, one of the stories that, that I've shared before, but I'll share again, is uh, when we grow up in families, a lot of times we might look at what our fathers do or maybe what our mothers do or our grandfathers. And I happen to be in a whole family of bankers. Okay, my dad was a CEO, an amazing banker. I learned so much from him. 
My brother went into banking and he's still in banking today. He's a phenomenal CEO of a small bank in Minnesota. My other brother was a CFO uh, that was working on launching uh, medical supply endeavors, uh, or he was a CFO for a um, a tail or a, I'm sorry, a tile business in southern Minnesota where they put tiles in uh, for farming ground and, and things like that. So we're all very financial. I was in banking for 25 years. Uh, well, that's what I grew up knowing and that's what success looked like to me because that's what my dad did and I just so admired my dad and still do to this day. So I started out in banking and that was totally God's will for my life at that time. But if I would have stayed in banking, I would have missed the purpose for my life. I got a lot of information in banking. I was able to apply my purpose that I didn't even realize was my purpose back then. Thank goodness for really awesome godly leaders that could see the gifts and talents and sort of how I was created. And they were able to give me assignments that just totally fed that, right? But if I would have seen banking as my purpose, when I moved out to Colorado, and I would start applying at banks because it was all I knew, but I didn't get banking jobs, I could have had a real identity crisis. I could have thought, oh my goodness, I am such a failure. I didn't get a job at a bank. When all the while, God was giving me that envelope, that invitation to go to the next level, the next season. So in this, this is how we bring our vision to reality, which is my purpose is helping people bring vision to reality. That's where I get life and energy. And I just love it. I love to hear about people's vision and help lay out the steps to be able to bring that to reality. So what is your purpose? What is the vision God has given you? And will this help you? And I think it probably will to know how this process works so you can start to take the steps to identify what it is God's inviting you to do to receive that invitation and then apply the steps to make it happen. All right, so vision to reality. So this is what it looks like. You see there's a little, sort of like a little hook in a way, it's like a red, that little red arrow you see behind me. So this is where the Lord starts giving us a little nudge and an invitation. And it looks like this. Did you see that envelope pop up? He sends an invitation, whether it's in our sleep. I was telling you a little bit about that in the program yesterday, or maybe that was today, but anyway, that receiving things uh, where we are sleeping and the Lord sometimes will speak to us or give us an invitation or whether we just start to get a desire in our hearts to do something or maybe we're just getting uncomfortable in what we're doing and we're wondering why well the Lord brings that invitation in and this is an idea that he's presenting to us and inviting say would you be willing son or daughter to receive this invitation and go to the next season what he wants for us is to have a life of invitations and then going to the next and going to the next. And in this illustration, you see as that invitation comes in, there is a process that we follow to bring that vision, that invitation into reality. And then it might start to go down or stagnate or maybe feeling like, Lord, this just isn't fulfilling me anymore. And lo and behold, here comes another invitation. After we go through the process, we can know successfully and we go through when we're ready for that next invitation, it is an invitation that comes in and brings us to a higher level and a higher level. Do you know in this life when we walk with God, we have never made it or attained total success. I believe that we will continue to go to the next level with the Lord, go to the next level. And then when we step into heaven, we will continue to go to the next level. I believe that when we follow our purpose and as we follow these levels of success, which we'll go into much more detail on uh, in the next program, we will continue to have promotion, promotion, promotion into and through all of eternity. Isn't that exciting? 
We are just starting an adventure with the Lord here on earth. Okay, well, we are out of time already. And so I want to encourage you uh, with a couple things. First of all, I've got a free download for you uh, for this series. If you go to KarenConrad.net, I am, uh, I've loaded on my website the series that we'll go through. It's a four step series. When God gives you that invitation, you go through a process. And the first one is distress. Okay. It's normal. So don't be concerned about that. If you're in distress and you just didn't know what it was, <laughs> we'll be going through that with that new idea. So go to my website, KarenConrad.net, download that. It's completely free of charge and it is a chart to help you navigate through this process. You're really going to love it. It is a great chart. It's something that my husband Dave put together for me. Uh, and I'll tell you, once I read it, I was like, Oh, where was this 10 years ago when I needed it as I was starting out as an entrepreneur? I, I believe it'll be a real blessing for you. So KarenConrad.net and join me for the next program as we dig in deep to bringing that vision to reality. Thank you for joining me for the series Launch Into Success. I hope it's been a blessing for you and an encouragement uh, God has put something big on your heart, which I know he has. I believe this series will help you see that vision become reality. Remember to get that free download. Go to KarenConrad.net and the PowerPoint slide that I was sharing that's got the dream, uh, distress, develop and demonstrate. That is available for you completely free of charge. KarenConrad.net. Go to shop, find the download and it's yours completely free. So thank you so much. Join me again on Living with Karen Conrad. When you're talking about Jesus, you're talking about truth. When you're talking about the Word, you're talking about truth. And they are the same. And the truth is what sets you free. God is raising up an army at Karis Bible College. And you're part of that army. Amen. We need to live with a purpose that is greater than ourselves. There's a whole world that needs to know Jesus Christ. There's a whole world that needs to see the power of the Holy Spirit in demonstration. Whenever I went to Paris, I discovered who I am in Christ and who Christ is in me and that I am here with a purpose. It sort of created some sort of spark, created some sort of life in me. If he's living in me, that, that's a great revelation. I know it's a simple truth, but that changed my life. I love the teaching, of course, he teaches the truth and the faith and the love of God. We believe that Karis Bible College is the best Bible college in the world. You couldn't convince me otherwise. We want to have that revelation that's coming out of this, this school. We want that. Christ met me where I was at. I didn't have to become something in order to get, to get Christ to love me. It was just because of the message I used to hear from Andrew Oma, and I just want to say thank you to him. This is Andrew Womack, and I want to welcome all of you that have come to our Karis Bible study. I tell you, I'm excited about this. We now have hundreds of Bible studies going on all around the world. We've just made a push into the UK, and I think we have 40 or more Bible studies in the UK now, as well as all across the United States and around the world. I've even heard some people that do this online, and they have people from multiple countries watching, and they're going through these Bible studies. Of course, you know that the Bible studies are taught by our alumni, people that have ha sat under this ministry, that have received these truths, and we are now using them to help share these truths with you. And I just want to encourage you to open up your heart because uh, these Bible studies are taking the fundamental truths that God has shown me, and these people are teaching those to you. And I know that God is no respecter of persons. The way the Word of God has changed my life, it will change your life, but it really is dependent upon how you receive. So I want to encourage you to open up your heart and expect God to move in a powerful way. 
Th these are the truths that I've seen change my life and the lives of literally hundreds of thousands of other people. God will do the same for you. So open up your heart and receive and praise God. God bless you as you study the Word of God. Hello, my name's Greg Fritz, and I have the Good News Program here on GospelTruth.tv. I'm so thankful to Andrew Womack for offering the airtime on this channel absolutely free to those of us who are on it. But it does cost money. They've hired the best people to manage and to promote this channel. And if you enjoy it like I do, write Andrew a note and tell him thanks. And send an offering to help support GospelTruth.tv today. We're going to talk about doomsday phobias on today's Good News program. You don't want to miss it. Greg Fritz Ministries wants to minister to you through prayer. Call our helpline at 918-749-7744, Monday through Friday, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time. You can also order product and speak to someone about becoming a partner with Greg Fritz Ministries. We look forward to hearing from you today. The program you're about to watch is part of a free MP3 series we're making available to you as a gift from Greg Fritz Ministries entitled Carefree Living. Visit gregfritz.org to download the MP3s for free by entering code CARE72 at checkout. Are you tired of hearing nothing but bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hello, this is Greg Fritz. Welcome to the Good News program. We are continuing our teaching on what I call carefree living. And if you haven't gotten our study notes, they're just waiting for you. On our website, it's free of charge. We have study notes on all this teaching. I know you'll want to get this in your hands so you can go over the scriptures in the teaching because it's really the Word of God that makes a difference. I could tell you, live a carefree life, don't worry. But you've got to replace that worry with something. And that something is the Word of God. Take the Scriptures and begin to put the Scriptures in your heart and in your mind. And the Word of God will help you displace worry and fear and develop a resistance toward it. Many people are practicing this habit of worry and they don't even realize it. It's become an unconscious part of their, uh, of their life. And so first we recognize it, then we build up a resistance to it. And then you'll begin to notice it in other areas. But uh, it's, it's a process, and, it's, and it really is made possible by God's Word, by God's promises. We're not telling you to stick your head in the sand and ignore everything that's going on around you. We're certainly not telling you to be irresponsible and don't care about what's going on around you. But we're, t we're saying take your concerns, your anxiety, your cares, your worries, turn them over to God. And instead of worrying about them, believe God. Fill in that blank with faith. And you'll be able to enjoy your life more. You'll be happier. You'll sleep better. It'll just be better all around for you. If we could look at worry as a bad habit that we need to get over or get free from, then that's a great place to start. But if you see worry as a friend, some people think that worry is them doing their part that they're not really doing their job as a, as a loved one if they don't worry. And that's just wrong. There is no reason that we should be consumed by worry, fear, and anxiety, or any of its derivatives, because it, it affects our quality of life. And whether you realize it or not, all of this negative and fearful and fear-filled rhetoric that fills our world it, it creates a, an atmosphere, an environment of unbelief that is unhealthy. And people are responding to it in, in negative ways. It's not good what's happening in some areas of our society. And it's because of unbelief. It's, because of, it's by taking God out of the equation. People are left to their own devices. And worry at that point is the least of their concerns. They get into fears and phobias and changing laws, movements, and all kinds of things that are unscriptural that cause turmoil in our world. So you may not be able to do anything about that, 
But you and I can choose not to worry and not to live in fear. That's something that we can do right now. And so there are so many scriptures. One that comes to me now, Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. Jesus said that. In the world you will have trouble. I'm glad he said it. I'm glad he recognizes it. God's not up there going, hey, you know, I'm in heaven. I don't have any problems. You guys just need to cheer up. It's not so bad. He's not saying that. He's saying you're going to have tribulation. But Jesus said, be of good cheer for I've overcome the world. That's reason for us to be of good cheer. That's reason for us not to be sad and worried and fearful because Jesus has been where you are. In fact, the Bible says there is no temptation that is not that has overcome you that is not common to man. There is nothing that you've gone through that you're going through that other people haven't gone through. In fact, Jesus has been here. He is a high priest that's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He's been through what you're going through. He's already dealt with it. So what he's saying is, yeah, you're going to have problems and trouble in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You know, the best thing about a battle, if you're going into a battle, the best news you could possibly hear about is you're going to win. If you know that going in, then you can go through it with a different attitude. But if, you, if, if you're constantly weighing the results and weighing the facts and wondering, am I going to make it? Am I going to survive? Am I going to come out of this? Or is this going to overcome me, overwhelm me, defeat me, destroy me? If that's your thinking, if you think your you know, future is at risk every time you have a problem, it's going to be difficult for you to go through it with the right mentality. So Jesus is saying up front, you are going to have tribulation in this world, but be of good cheer. And you could, the negative side is, don't worry, don't be afraid, don't be filled with sadness, don't doubt, be of good cheer, he said, I have overcome the world. He's implying that you're going to come out on top, you're going to come out in victory, victory is yours, you're going to make it, you're going to be fine, God's going to take care of you. If you know that going in, then you can be happy throughout the process. I made this comment, and it's true. Enjoy the journey, because it's going to be a long one. <laughs> that, that may sound negative, but it's true. Life is the journey. We've got to learn how to enjoy life. Maybe all your goals aren't met. And maybe you haven't reached maybe your goals this year, this month, this week. And maybe you're striving to try and get ahead. And you think one of, one of these days I'm going to reach that goal. One of the, you know what? You can be happy now. You can choose not to worry now. You can choose to be free right now. So back to the subject of this session, we're talking about a culture of fear and worry. And I talked to you in the last session about nursery rhymes. And if you want to go back and listen to that, you can. Maybe you want to skip that one. Um, uh, it's also in the series. If you get the free download, you can hear that. But I, I told the story about it as a child in, I believe it was second grade. I'm seven or eight years old. We had a bomb drill. And this is part of our experience as children. And many of you, if you're old enough, you remember doing this. I, thankfully, I think they've quit doing it now. But they marched all of us, you know, not marched us. They commanded all of us to get under our desks and put our head down to prepare for nuclear holocaust. And we had to, of course, find out what does this mean. And they explained to us that Russia has missiles pointed at the United States. This was back in the height of the Cold War. And so they're explaining to all of us children that Russia has all these missiles with nuclear warheads pointed at the United States. But we also have missiles with nuclear warheads pointed at Russia. But at any moment, somebody over there, over here could push a button and launch all these missiles and then the world would blow up in a nuclear bomb and you have to get under your desk to prepare for that. Which, by the way, if you have a nuclear blast in your school, your desk is not going to save you. I mean, it was just, it, it, all it did was cause an eight-year-old boy to think about things that I had no business thinking about. That was years ago, and all of these years later, decades, we've not had a nuclear holocaust. 
So any time and effort that I had, would have spent worrying about nuclear holocaust was wasted time and effort. It was just an exercise in futility. And it's even worse than that because it, it robs you of your quality of life. I use that as an example, but there are so many scenarios that we face, real and imagined, that cause worry and fear to dominate our thinking that are diabolical. They are not of God. God is your father. God is your protector. God is your source. He's your helper. And he doesn't want you running around worried about nuclear holocaust. And can I just say that if you read the book of Revelation, you see what the end of the world is going to be. It's already been predicted, prophesied, promised. It's in the word of God. And Russia's not going to do it. China's not going to do it. The United States is not going to bring about the end of the world. God's going to do it. And he's going to do it exactly the way he said it would be done. There are certain lines in humanity, in, in, in nations, in world history, there are certain lines that cannot be crossed. There, there are divine demarcations. And one of those lines is the destruction of God's planet. I know he doesn't get involved in too much politics, maybe in certain countries, and you may think they're kind of on their own and they're crazy and they're evil and they're dangerous. But God is not going to allow mankind to destroy itself with a nuclear war. That's just not going to happen. If it was, it would be in the Bible. God didn't write all these prophecies and then have this clause that says, unless man destroys it with a nuclear, all this is going to happen unless people do something that I'm not expecting. That's just not how it's going to happen. You don't have to worry about these doomsday scenarios. And there are many. This is, I, I'm not saying you're worried about these things, but I'm talking about these principles because over and over again they come. Every year, every month, every week, through the news and through the scientific community and through whatever, and they wear people down. And you may not be so overtly affected by them, but some people are. People are making world decisions based on these doomsday scenarios and they can't all be true. You know, the world can't end five different ways. It can only end one way. So it's like to me, all of these different scenarios are out there just to give somebody something to worry about. Oh, okay, nuclear holocaust doesn't scare you. What about this one? And if that doesn't, what about this one? You know, when I was a kid, not only were we concerned about nuclear holocaust, but then they came up with a new one, the ozone layer, the ozone hole. So there's this invisible layer around the earth and there's a hole in it and it protects us from the sun's harmful rays. And because of pollution, they said chloral floral carbons, car car whatever that is produced by air conditioners and aerosol sprays that it was destroying the ozone layer and it was going to be destroyed and then the sun was going to burn us all so if nuclear holocaust isn't enough to scare you you could worry about an ozone layer that you can't see that is being destroyed even as we speak and soon the sun's harmful rays is going to destroy life on this planet and, and that, that one was a big deal. And now we don't even hear about that anymore. In fact, I did see a report on the ozone hole and it's gotten smaller. So what do they do? Do they come out and say, hey guys, don't worry about the ozone layer anymore. That's all been fixed. They don't say that. They just move on to something else that's more frightening and more scary, something you can't prove, something you can't see, and something you can't change. And they want you to live in fear and dread. And, and this is all unscriptural. It's not necessary. Let's say no to fear and no to worry. But this is how it creeps in. It just, there, there's really, the world's filled with people that don't, that don't know God and, and probably living under a sense of dread and foreboding. Uh, they may, may, maybe they have a sense that judgment is coming. And without Jesus, it is. But they, I am not going to allow worldly people to project their pessimism and their dread of the future on me. For you and I who love God and know God, our future is bright. In fact, it's brighter than the past. The best days we have are ahead of us. In fact, it ends in heaven and that's beyond anything you could imagine. 
So for a Christian to dread the future is just counterproductive, it's illogical, it's unscriptural. Christians ought to be excited about the future. The best things that will ever happen to you in your life are coming in the future. So I am not going to be afraid of the future. Then there was this Y2K scare. Remember that one? The Y2K scare was if you weren't uh, old enough to at that time to remember the computers. We all went to computers because they told us how great computers were. So everybody got their computers and they got all set up on computers. And then they said, uh oh, we forgot to program into the computers the year 2000. So at 1999, you know, at 12 a.m., when it, when it becomes the year 2000, the computers are not going to recognize 2000. They're going to go back to 1900. And supposedly this was going to bring the modern world to a screeching halt. It was going to stop food distribution and water treatment plants. And we were all going to face starvation and dying of thirst. And I mean, they, they talked about the people started gathering food and putting them in bunkers and getting guns. I mean, prepared for a computer glitch that was going to bring the modern world to an end. And, you know... And I kept thinking, you know, we've lived without computers, and I believe if if the we could probably live without them in the future, I, uh, it, it just didn't make sense to me. We serve a God who took three million people out into the a desert with no food and water, and brought water out of a rock, and provided food manna from heaven. God did not let His people starve and die of thirst in the desert. I just can't see him, you know, maybe you think God's older now. God doesn't get old, but let's say God's older and, and more feeble now. Is that, is that really true? Is, is modern technology going to overwhelm God's ability to rescue and help his people? Absolutely not. Don't buy into these. I'm going back and using these past phobias, fears, scenarios just to, 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 to help us learn from them, because they're not done. There'll be plenty more in our lifetime, and they will be big, and they will be bad, and they will be unprovable, and they will be desperate, and they'll be upon us, and they'll try to convince us that life is going to end if, if this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen. I'm not going to buy into that. I'm going to serve God I just have one life to live and I'm not going to waste it worrying about things that haven't happened, that might not happen, that won't happen. Obviously, all of these things can't happen. The world can only end one way. And, and you know, when, when I was, had that problem with the nuclear holocaust and the nuclear missiles and I was eight years old, I, I went home from school after the bomb drill and I was so scared, I called my dad. I said, Dad, I can't sleep. And he comes to my bedside and he said, what's the matter, son? He was a great dad. He always had the right answer except for this night. I said, he said, what's the matter? I said, I can't sleep because... He said, well, why can't you sleep? And I thought I was explaining something to him. I said, well, you may not be aware of this, but Russia has nuclear missiles pointed at us right now. And we have nuclear missiles pointed at Russia right now. And at any moment, somebody could push a button and launch those missiles and the whole world would blow up in a nuclear blast. And I'm scared. I, I don't want to die. I can't sleep. And he, he wasn't prepared for such a deep conversation at nine o'clock at night, I assume. And he looked at me with all the compassion he could muster. And he said, well, son, we've all got to die sometime. <laughs> and I was like, that's it? That's all you got? And he got up and went to bed. He slept like a baby. And I'm like, got to die sometime. That's what I'm trying to avoid. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I don't want to die in a nuclear blast. So I did what any... Uh, you know, logical thinking eight-year-old would do at a moment like that. I called for my mom, and she, you know, she came in and soothed my fears. But th th that's th that's just you know, you've all got to die sometime. There, there's a there's a quote from somebody that goes like this: a, a, a coward dies a thousand deaths, but a brave man only dies once. We could worry about a thousand doomsday scenarios. We could develop a, 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 a constant state of fear based on the future of the planet. 
And, and, and rather than that, I'd rather just believe God and enjoy my life because really it can only end one way. Why worry about a thousand different variations? And God's already told us how it's going to end. And God said, we're not appointed to wrath. He's going to take care of us. He's going to watch over us. He's going to provide for us. He's promised us everything we need to live life here. And by us jumping forward into some kind of doomsday end of the world scenario, we are, we are wasting a life that God has given to us that could be better spent in faith, in happiness, in joy, in helping others, in love. Listen, sometimes the best thing you can do for your friends and loved ones is just to be happy and just to not be worried. Quit dumping your concerns on everybody else. Reject them. Refuse to worry about things you can't change. Don't let that ruin the life that you're living. Um, I, I got this article. I wanted to read a couple of things, and and um, it's called. It's it's written about anti-natalists, and to me, this is the epitome of unbelief, unthankfulness, and and you'll see what I mean. In February, uh, a 27-year-old Indian man announced plans for an unusual lawsuit. He was going to sue his parents for begetting him, for being born. That's an interesting one. I wonder if that works. It was not our decision to be born, he told the BBC. Human existence is totally pointless. How ungrateful could you be? That is so sad. And that's what I'm saying. These scenarios, all this constant doom and gloom and dread, it affects people. People respond to this. And maybe it's just kind of a weight on the, in the back of your mind. But some of these people are really living out these fears and they're responding in ways like this guy. He's part of a movement called anti-natalists. These people wish they had never been born. I can't think of a, of a, of a better way to waste life than to be an anti-natalist. What an escape from reality. He, <clears throat> his complaint is that he believes it is wrong to bring new people into the world without their consent. <laughs> okay, that, I see the problem there. He wanted to sue his parents for a symbolic amount of money to instill the, that fear among parents in general because parents don't think before having a child. So this philosophy is called anti-natalism. And I heard this one time, and this is more reality. This teenager got in trouble again, and one of his defenses was, well, I didn't ask to be born. And the father looked back and said, well, if you had, the answer would have been no, and go to your room, whatever. You know, that's more reality. That's where I came from. But uh, these guys have just totally gone completely crazy. And they've said that life, even under the best of circumstances, is not a gift or a miracle, but rather a harm and an imposition. You know, I'm telling you, all of this doom and gloom is affecting people in, in very, very detrimental ways. When we hear about it, it's most often in context when we hear about all of these uh, people that want to not be alive or not have children. It's in the context of, of uh, climate crisis. These activists are worried about bringing people into a world threatened by rising seas, mass displacement, and other calamities. Antinatalists believe that procreation has always been and will always be wrong because of life suffering. What is similar to both antinatalists and climate activists is that they are seeing an increase in attention due to general pessimism about the state of the world. And, and that really explains it. They, they have a pessimism about the state of the world. Can I urge you, let's reject pessimism about the state of the world. If you want to change your views, start by being thankful that you're alive, that you exist. Being thankful to the God of creation that he made a place for you to live and to meet him. That he feeds you, that he clothes you, that he gives you an opportunity to work and be paid and pay your bills and be a responsible person. Those things are things we should be thankful for, not resent. But all of this doom and gloom and pessimism is all around us all the time. And these poor people have really just believed it all. 
and they've just given up hope. It has robbed them of their very desire to live. And that is a shame in our world today. We have hope. There is a group called Zero Population Growth that struck out on its own with a more radical agenda. The leader, is, is he's launched another group called the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement with the goal of phasing out the human race by voluntarily ceasing to breed. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I said, well, that's crazy. Well, these poor people have been raised in our schools. They've been educated in our schools. They have em embraced our culture. And this is the conclusion. When you get all of this information without God and without God's word, you are at the best going to be worried and anxious. At the worst, you're going to end up like one of these people who are, who are going exactly against God's command for us to be fruitful and multiply. Do you understand that? So you can see that the, the enemies behind this zero population, that's exactly opposite of what God told us to do in the garden. He said, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. That was a command that's never been rescinded. That's never been amended. It's still in force. God wants people. He wants people to have people. And here they are due to all of these concerns and all of the bad news and all of the things that could happen, rising sea levels and climate warming and all these things that, you know, I got to ask you, has the rising sea level hurt you yet? Has it affected you? Has the rise in temperature r ruined your life? All of this is based on what's going to happen, what could happen, what should happen, what might happen. These are things that are not under our jurisdiction. God's going to take care of his planet. God's not going to let man destroy it. And the last thing he wants is for you and I to run around afraid of what's going to happen to our future. God's got you under his control. You're under the wings of the shadow and the shadow of the Almighty. You're protected by God himself. A thousand may fall at my side and 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. There's promise after promise in scripture that go against what these people believe and what they think. It's just unscriptural. We've got to rise above all this dread and fear and be people of faith. We ought to be happy to be alive and we ought to have a great view of the future. The best is yet to come for us. Our future's out of this world. If you meditate and think about that, then you cannot take up space in your mind with all these doomsday phobias. Well, that's all the time we have today. I hope you got something out of this. I'm just trying to push back on this flood of bad news that we get day in and day out. And I just want to help you to step back, take a deep breath, and be happy. Amen. Well, I got more teaching. We'll continue on the next program. And until then, may God's best be yours. In this new series, you'll learn from the scriptures why worry is not an option and how to replace fear with faith in the midst of any trial. Visit gregfritz.org to download the MP3s for free by entering code CARE72 at checkout. Greg Fritz Ministries wants to minister to you through prayer. Call our helpline at 918-749-7744, Monday through Friday, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time. If you hadn't gotten my new book yet, you should consider getting this book, Living With No Regrets. I believe this is some of the most uh, applicable, important teaching I've ever done. People are buying the book and we're getting really good response. It simply helps every person deal with the past. If you have things in your past that you regret, maybe there are things that you wish you hadn't done that you did, or things you wish you had have done that you wish you didn't do, that causes regret, and Jesus can wipe away every tear of regret in your life. God wants you to be happy. He wants to set us free so that we can go into our future with no strings attached. Get your copy of Greg's new book, Living With No Regrets, on our website, gregfritz.org. Bring Karis with you wherever you go with our new Karis app. Free to download, the Karis app allows you to easily access everything Karis Bible College has to offer in one place. Receive exclusive grace content and explore unique Karis features. 
Watch or listen to archived resources and teachings. Follow along with the Bible reading plan or listen to the audio Bible. The Karis app brings everything in one place. Download your app today. I'd like to encourage you to call in. And I know that God is speaking to many, many people. And you may have had the Lord touch you today. And if you just need somebody to touch and agree with you, the Scripture says, If any two of you agree touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. So we have these people, I mean powerful people, who love God and are equipped in the Word of God. They're there to pray with you and help you. The number is 719-635-1111. That's 719-635-1111. Hello, I'm Kenneth Copeland. Every believer has a voice, and it's the voice of victory. My God has made the world Matthew 17, 14. When they came down and so forth, Lord, have mercy on my son. Jesus answered, Jesus rebuked the devil. Then came his disciples to Jesus apart and said, why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it'll remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Howbeit this kind goeth out, but this goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Devils do not respond to fasting. No, they don't respond to fasting. So what is Jesus talking about here? This kind of unbelief goes out with prayer and fasting. Well, yes. But that's not the key issue here. And this went on, and it went on, and it went on, and it went on, and it went on. They kept arguing with one another about who's going to be the greatest. Where am I going to be in the kingdom of God? He's going to kick Rome out of here in a few days. And what's going to happen to me? What's going to, what am I going to get? What am I going to do? Peter said, what about this fellow? Talking about John. And Jesus said, what about him? In other words, do you tend to your business? I mean, this kept going on all over and over and over again. Devils don't respond to fasting. The people that are helped in fasting are the ones that do the fasting. Fasting doesn't change God. Fasting doesn't change devils. Fasting won't get devils out. Well, what is he talking about then? Had they been spending time fasting and praying and worshiping and praising God and pulled in closer to Jesus, spent time in worship instead of time in worry, worrying about their own position. That's what he's talking about. Pulled in there to a place, the closeness of God, and pulled close to one another and come to that place where, where you begin to think, well, praise God. Jesus knows what he's doing. And all of us, we, we, hey, we'll, we'll get a good thing. He'll take care of us. Go ahead to God. Let's stay strong. Man, I mean, they had to nail that demon. Now, I want to mention something about Peter, James, and John. What is the thing about Peter, James, 
and John. Why those three? We know John is the apostle of love, right? We know Peter had a revelation now at the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter was very bold. What about James? Well, think about it. James is John's brother. This speaks well of Mr. Zebedee, their dad. I believe that John and James both had that, that, that love about them that caused them to be different kind of men. Peter knew who Jesus was and he's very bold. And John, the apostle of love and his brother James. I, I believe James what was another loving man because they had been sons of thunder. Praise God. Hallelujah. They were loving men. Came from a loving, from a loving family, obviously. Those two men, especially. Jesus trusted them. Now, What happens when you spend time fasting and worshiping? You get your flesh out of the way. Different times over the years. Gloria and I have done this. I've done it numbers of times. Just, just few days ago, well, in fact, a little over a week ago, you have something strong on your heart. And uh, you need answers. So what do you do? You go back to the book of James. Let's go there now. Right where we were in that very first chapter of the book of James. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into the different temptations, tests, and trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom. Now, in certain cases, Gloria and I have been in places where we just needed the wisdom of God. Any man that lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth. Or let him ask. He gives to all men liberally. Upbraid means to find fault. And finds no fault and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. So, for instance, when Gloria spent years. I mean, she spent, she, she spent 30 years. I mean, it began from the time we were at ORU in Tulsa. Uh, uh, she started planning her house and, and she's planning this house and planning it. And she, she took, she, first she carried, carried uh, the magazines around with us and finally got so many architectural digests and so forth. Uh, I said, Gloria, uh, just cut the pictures out. She like, oh, okay. And so she cut out the pictures and, and just, and then she got her some graph paper and we'd be on the road for a while and we'd come back and then she'd go to the dining room table and out and go all of those pictures and, and, and then all the graph paper and so forth. And she, and she had everything placed like she wanted it and she moved the rooms around. 
And she was playing house, just having a wonderful time at it. <sighs> she said, Kenneth, this house just, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. I can't find a way to cut it down. I said, Gloria, it's a dream, girl, dream on. She said, you mean it? I said, yeah, dream on. So now, I mean, and for 30 years she did that. Well, finally, she said, I, I'm going to either have to build this house or just forget it. She said, now, all I need to know is it's God's will. If it's not, I've had a wonderful time with it and I have no regrets at all. Now, God kept us in nice places. We, the, every house we had and we, you know, we, we don't borrow money. And every house got a little better and that one got a little better and that one got a little better. And, and we finally wound up, man, for, we lived in it for 20 years and just, oh, and enjoyed it. And she said, I'm going to have to do it. I said, well, you know what? I'll tell you what let's do. Let's, uh, let's just pull aside and, and we'll just, We'll just fast for three days and, and seek the Lord and see what he says. And uh, so we did that. I've never gone the whole three days without the answer. And uh, so here we were in late in the evening of the second day. And we're just sitting there on the couch at our our little little prayer place, prayer cabin. So we're just sitting there on the couch. And, oh my, the word of the Lord came to me. And, and he said, right in here. And when you're fasting, it's 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 you're more sensitive to it. And um, see, this is what they should have been doing. You get more sensitive to what Jesus is doing and what he's saying. And the Lord said, I want you to minister these verses of scripture to her because this house is part of your prosperity. Okay. Good. So I went to the 54th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Jesus on the cross in the 53rd. And then here he is in the 54th uh, and talking to the church, build and lengthen your cords and your stakes and so forth. So I just opened my Bible and I said, Gloria, here's what the Lord said for me to read, to, to minister to you, to build this house. And I started reading it and she just began to cry. It, and and it, she wasn't weeping. She was just crying. I said, what is it, baby? She said, those are the very verses of scripture that I put on my little list when we were in Tulsa in that little nothing of a house we lived in, the, the perfect house for this family and for this ministry. And those were the verses of scripture. God confirmed it. Do you see that? Now here, just, I mean, just, you know, just, just a tad over a week ago, I fasted a Saturday, Sunday, and Monday for a very specific thing. And um, here I was, uh, the last day of the fast, which would have been over Monday evening at six. And the word of the Lord came to me very, very plainly. And a little while before five, and he spoke to me just exactly what he, what, uh, exactly what he, what he had to say to me. I heard it. He said, your fast is over. I love you. I'm very interested in your welfare and success and so forth and so on. I had my answer my fast was over. I still didn't eat until six o'clock. 
Now, when you go into a fast like that, you have no hunger. But something happens in your spirit. I'm still, I mean, that's just a little over a week ago. I'm still strongly under the influence of it tonight. I saw things in preparing this message for this service and for this week. I saw things in it that I've never seen before. That's what begins to happen when, when your spirit is open to God and you're hearing from him and things are, are, are become stronger and stronger on the inside. Had they been doing that, had they been spending time on their knees before God and worshiping him, had they been saying, I don't know what the three of them are doing up there on that mountain, but it must be important because the master has them up there. And then when they came down, they were amazed at him because his face still shone with that glow and glory. Had they been taking the time had they been spending time thinking about him instead of about themselves, the devil would not have been able to get in there and create an argumentative situation between them. Now, now let, me, let me tell you something else here. Let's, let's think about this. There are people that just have an argumentative um, Care about them. What is strife? Anything? Anyway, strife is anything that violates the law of love. It doesn't have to be a loud argument. Gloria mentioned to me this afternoon. I was discussing this message with her. She said, "Well, hey, you can get mad at yourself." Well, I hadn't thought about that. You can argue with yourself and, and create the same kind of thing on the inside. Just, and your, your brain's not wired for that. Creates confusion. Medical science has proven that. Dr. Caroline Leaf proved that. I mean, scientifically. Of course, that woman is, is amazing. And, and the, the things that God has opened to her and, and has shown her in the spirit about the brain and how the mind works. And then, oh, my, <laughs> Dr. Avery Jackson, I wish I was there where I could, where I could see your face and your family at night, praise God. That the things that I've learned from you, sir, about the mind, the will, and the emotions, and the brain, especially the brain, in strife and arguments. Now, let, let's go over now to the book of Galatians once again. Now we know in the fifth chapter and the 22nd verse, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. But now wait a minute. What about the works of the flesh? Verse 19, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And he's writing to Christian people, born again, Holy Spirit baptized Christian people. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, 
hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Look at the company strife keeps. It isn't worth it. It is absolutely not worth it. The things that it destroys. It destroys dreams. The very apostles of the Lamb, of course Satan attacked them with that. But these are the same men that changed the history of the world. What changed everything? First of all, the new birth happened right there. Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the spirit. That's when they were born again. And then on the day of Pentecost, glory to God, filled to overflowing with the love of God himself, the spirit of the living God. Once that took place, what happened? The love of God was shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost. Can you see it? The strife and the fussing was over. Now they knew who they were. The devil was defeated and the rest is history strife is a killer it's a killer of families it's a killer of nations this nation is suffering with it today like I've and I've, I've been around a long time I'm 83 years old I've seen a lot come and go in this country I've never seen this kind of strife before between parties, I have never seen it. They've always, you know, politically fought one another. Not like, not like today. No. Not like that. I, I, I've, it opens this nation to terrible, terrible consequences. And I'll tell you right now, if it, were, if it were not for the praying people in this country, it would destroy it. Because that's what Jesus said. A house divided against itself can't stand. What's it saying? A house that's arguing and fighting with one another. Strife, confusion, every evil work. And the devil just runs away with it. Because you've just handed him your life. Just handed it to him free of charge. Amen. It's just not worth it. So how, how do you do it? How, how do you change it? Greater is he that is in thee. Greater is the love that is in me than the hate that is in them. Learn how Learn, learn how to put the greater one to work for you. I learned this from Brother Kenneth Hagin many, many years ago. Learn how to, to put the greater one, the love of God, the God himself who is love. Learn how to put him to work for you. The first thing is just what James said. Shut your mouth. Just, just shut it. Don't be talking about it. Shut it down. And they're just ranting and raving and screaming and going on, my, 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 man, using all kinds of language. And, and you're just standing there looking at them and, and saying, oh, God, greater is, greater is the love in me than the hate that's in them, the anger that's in them. The greater one is in me. Take the 
the word of faith wherever you go with the Believer's Voice of Victory magazine. Since 1973, KCM has delivered the Believer's Voice of Victory magazine worldwide. We're reaching nearly 400,000 people in 202 countries and territories on five continents. All absolutely free. Every magazine contains faith-building articles from Kenneth and Gloria Copeland and other guest authors. Read encouraging stories from people like you in testimonies of real-life victory. Equip your kids with powerful tools for spiritual growth in Commander Kelly's Corner. With a variety of viewing formats available, sharing is easier than ever. Download a digital copy for your tablet or mobile device. Click on the interactive magazine option where you'll find bonus content, videos, and downloads. Sign up for your free monthly subscription or download your copy today at kcm.org. Strife. It's an unseen enemy that's out to divide and destroy. You can see its effects daily on the news, social media, across nations, and even in our churches. But Jesus has given you authority over strife to overcome it. Learn how in the Living Free from Strife package, two mini books by Kenneth Copeland, A House Not Divided, and How to Conquer Strife, along with his CD teaching, The Force of Forgiveness, also available as digital downloads. Understand the importance of James 3.16. Where there is strife, there's every evil work. God has empowered you to be a peacemaker. Overcome strife with the power of praise and thanksgiving. See how faith and answered prayer are vitally linked to forgiveness. Make a stand against division in your home, church, and nation. Greater is the power of love in you through the Holy Spirit than any strife that is in the world. What dream? has God put in your heart? Is it something for your family, your ministry, maybe your future? Well, today, Brother Copeland shared that strife is anything that violates the law of love. And what strife does is it destroys dreams. It has terrible consequences. But the greater one in you is God who is love, and he is greater than the strife that is in this world. Love is greater than the hate. Love is greater than all the anger out there. When strife tries to come against you, what do you do? Don't take it. Don't receive it because violating the law of love is not worth being robbed of the blessing of the Lord. Stay connected to the blessing. Receive what Jesus has provided for you because you, you have a choice. Choose God's love. When you do, you put the greater one who is in you to work for you. Now, this package that we're making available to you, the Living Free from Strife package, includes three products by Kenneth Copeland. And this set of teaching resources will help you identify the enemy's tactics of stirring up strife and how to conquer it, how to get it out of your life. And strife is not something you and I should take casually. James 3.16 says where strife is, there's confusion in every evil work and you do not want to let strife go unchecked in your life. And it's not one of those things that just eventually goes away. No, it's something that has to be removed and conquered by faith in the word of God. So we want you to use these resources as a guide to know how to stand strong in faith, praising God without being drawn into the conflict of strife, walking in love, brings God's presence and peace into your family, into your community. It can do it right here into this nation. So be sure to get your free package today on kcm.org. And while you're online, remember to download your free copy of the broadcast study notes for this week. Just go to kcm.org slash notes. And all of these notes contain all the scriptures, all the teaching points from each day's message. And KCM makes these notes available to you for free. So download them, study them right along with Brother Copeland this week. Maybe later use them to preach your own message, preach to your family or a small group. But get the word into your life, get it into your heart, and then let the word come back out of your mouth with faith and power in Jesus' name. Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. We'll see you again next time. Until then, remember that God loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord. Continue to grow in your faith in God. Go to kcm.org to download or request your free copy of today's Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. Believe God to bring new visions, His manifested power, and great change in your life.
Truth and Liberty Coalition. It's about what God's doing in the nations. This is a global movement, and what's happening in America is important because if America can get through this chapter, it's going to have ramifications for the reformation of nations all over the world. This is, the, this is a coalition for everyone watching, not just for America. Beyond the Game with Tony and JB, stories that need to be told. To the outside world, it looked like there was nothing happening. I, that wasn't true. It's things like that that happen all the time that the public doesn't know about. Your body has an expiration date. I'm in bed the day after my surgery. Brian says, Anthony, when is enough enough? Beyond the Game with Tony and JB. Stories you won't hear anywhere else. Viewer supported Gospel Truth TV is free to listeners and free of charge for your favorite teachers. This is what we're hearing from people just like you receiving these messages of God's unconditional love and grace. Your teachings are transforming my life. Thank you. When you give to Gospel Truth TV, you're changing your life and touching countless others around the world. Click the Give button at the top or text GIVE to 719-301-2552. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Jesus forgave us of all sin, past, present, and even future sin. Andrew brought good news to me. I could understand the Bible more the way he taught it. Jesus forgave you one time, and that's for everything. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing to teach on a series that I've entitled, Are You Satisfied with Jesus? And I wrote this little pamphlet. It's just 30 pages or less in one day. I've edited it some since then, but I just sat down and wrote this based on what Philip said in John chapter 14, where Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. He was saying, Jesus, I'm not satisfied with you, but I'd be satisfied if I saw the Father. If Jesus doesn't satisfy you, the problem is with you not with Jesus. And Jesus went on to say, Philip, if you see me, you've seen the Father. How do you say then, show us the Father? And most people would think, well, no, they, there's a difference. Jesus was in a body. And I spent a lot of time talking about this. I, I know that not everybody watches every day, so please go to our website or get these materials so that you can get this in its context. I hadn't got time to go back over it. But Jesus' body was like his vehicle that he used to get around in. And it was just a plain vehicle. It wasn't a Rolls Royce. It didn't look like God. It looked like just a natural, normal person. But inside, he was God, manifest in the flesh. He was the glory of God. And the problem wasn't that he wasn't a perfect representation of God. It was that Philip was looking on the vehicle that he got around in instead of the real him. The real you, the real me, isn't our physical body. It's the person that's on the inside. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, this is where Samuel came to anoint uh, David to be king. And Samuel had anointed Saul to be king. Saul was the tallest man in the entire nation. He was a huge, huge specimen of a man. And Samuel just assumed that the next king would be like that. And so when he saw Eliab, Jesse's oldest son, he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord spoke to him and he says, don't go by what he looks like on the outside. And then it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God doesn't look at the vehicle you're driving around in. He looks at you. God is not dealing with you based on your physical flesh. He's dealing with you based on who you are in the spirit. And that's the way we should be dealing with each other. And so I'm saying all these things to say that, see, Philip missed who Jesus really was because he was only looking at his vehicle. 
He was only looking on the external. He didn't see who he really was on the inside. And when Jesus rose from the dead, every single time that he appeared to his disciples, eight times recorded in Scripture, they had trouble recognizing him. Sometimes that's a little subtle. I use John chapter 21. I use Matthew chapter 28. And especially Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 and 17, it says that when they saw him, they doubted. These were his 11 disciples, the people who had been with him for three and a half years, day and night. And some of them doubted that it was really him and they were looking at him. Jesus even said in the 24th chapter of Luke, he says, put your finger into the print of the nails and thrust your hand into my side. Man, Jesus had a physical body and yet they had trouble recognizing him. And the example I was using at the close of yesterday's program was where the two disciples were rock walking on the road to Emmaus. They were talking about the resurrection. They had heard the report that Jesus was raised from the dead, and yet they were struggling to believe in it. They were reasoning among themselves, and it says their eyes were holding. Man, I don't have the words to describe this quickly, I've got entire series where I teach on this, but when you are just operating out of your human mind and you aren't letting your spirit inspire you, it is really, really hard to relate to God because God is a spirit. John 4, 24, God is a spirit and those who worship him, I believe you could say those who really connect with him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And your brain can be a hindrance to you having relationship with God. You can just try to be figure everything out. How could this be? That's what these disciples were doing. They had heard the report that Jesus was raised from the dead, but how could this be? They'd seen many people die. They'd never seen anybody come back from the dead. How could this be? And Jesus walked with them and asked them why they were sad. And they said, are you only a visitor in Jerusalem? You don't know what's happened. He said, what things? And they began to tell him about the death, crucifixion of Jesus. And they said, and some of our company came and told us that he was alive. And Jesus began to rebuke them. And he says, how long is it going to be until you understand the scriptures? And beginning at Moses and going all the way through the Old Testament, he showed them scripture after scripture after scripture of him being crucified and raised from the dead. And then they compelled him to enter in and eat with them. They still didn't know who he was. And as they sat at meat, they were eating. It says this in verse uh, 30. It says, And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them that he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. Their eyes were open, not that their physical eyes were closed. This is talking about their spiritual eyes were open. And they recognized him, not by sight, not by what his physical features were, but they re I believe that they recognized him because just three days before, he had taken the bread and the wine and he had his last supper and he blessed it. And they remembered that this is exactly the same words that he said, the same word. They recognized him by what he did, not by just sight. They had to recognize him by their heart. And herein lies the key why all of these disciples had trouble recognizing Jesus in his resurrected form, because this same story that's re reported in great detail over in Luke chapter 24, the same thing is all summarized in one verse, in Mark chapter 16 in verse 12, and that says, After that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. When it says he appeared in another form, this didn't mean that he looked like a different person. Again, his body was the same because in Luke chapter 24 right there, after he had appeared to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they ran back to Jerusalem. And as they were telling the other disciples that they had seen Jesus and that he was alive, all of a sudden Jesus just appeared in their midst. And, he, and they doubted. Again, it was Jesus. They thought they were seeing a spirit. And he says, touch me. Feel me, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone the way that I have. And then he told Thomas, he says, put your finger into the print of the nails 
and put your hand into my side. He still had, his body was the same. It still bore scars. You know, this is a little bit of a sideline. Don't forget what I'm saying. But to me, this is significant that in Jesus' resurrected body, he still had the nail prints and the scars of crucifixion. When we get a resurrected body, old things are going to pass away. All things are going to become new. We won't have the deformities. We won't have the birth defects. We won't have the scars of this life. We're going to have a glorified body that's going to be pristine, perfect. The only person in heaven that will be bearing scars is Jesus. That's amazing to me. That's amazing that Almighty God would even become a man, but then to think that He would want to live forever in a body that had scars. But that's just because of His great love for us. That man, He's going to forever identify with us. And so anyway, He was in a body that still reflected. It was still the body. He, he didn't appear like you know, a different animal or something like that. He was a person. It was a person who was recognizable, and yet they didn't recognize him. Why? It says because he appeared in another form. You know what this form was? It was a spiritual body. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 says that the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit. They are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You have to discern spiritual things by the Spirit. You can't reason it out. You can't just wait until you see it, until you have an equation. Now, I'm not saying that Christians don't use their brain, that Christians are just operating somehow or another by inspiration and intuition, but I am saying that we are not limited to just physical, natural things. And people who are just operating out of their own intellect that becomes a, a barrier, a hindrance to them perceiving the Lord, just like Philip. Back to the original scriptures that I was using in John chapter 14, he struggled to see that Jesus was satisfying him, that Jesus had provided everything because he only knew him in the physical realm. He didn't know who was inside of that body. He didn't know the real Jesus. He, he was blinded because of just carnal, natural thinking. It says in Romans chapter 8 that the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You cannot please God. You cannot really know God if you are just trying to figure it out, if you are waiting until you see Him, until you have something physical, tangible come and prove to you. You have to know God by the Spirit. And this is where Philip missed it. He only knew God. He only knew Jesus in the flesh. He didn't know him by the Spirit. But now we can know him through the Spirit and we can relate to God and we can have a relationship with God that surpasses the relationship that the disciples had recorded in the gospel because they were only relating to him in the natural. This is the reason that he would, he told them 14 different times. There are 14 separate instances in the gospel that Jesus prophesied that he would, would die and be crucified. And seven of those times he prophesied that he would be raised from the dead. He told them this. Even the Pharisees remembered it. And that's the reason they went to Herod and said that they wanted a a group of soldiers to guard the tomb lest the disciples come steal the body and say that he was resurrected. The people that didn't even know God remember this, but his own people, his own disciples, they were they just missed it. There was a reason that they were called duh disciples because <laughs> they were dumber than a hammer in just their natural self. They didn't remember this, but once they got born again, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, John 14, 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, when He has come, will teach you all things and lead you into all truth and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have spoken unto you. That was Jesus speaking. One of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to bring things back to our remembrance. The Holy Spirit will quicken our hearts, not just our heads but it will bring things up out of our spirit. We can know things by the Spirit of God that you can't just figure out with your own understanding. 
You know, I could give you millions. I don't think that's an exaggeration. I could certainly say thousands, but I could give you a lot of illustrations of how God led me by the Spirit to do things that in the natural, there's no reason to do it. And yet it works. You know, such as giving things away like this. Did you know it costs me money to produce this? I have to have employees. We have a machine that prints these things ourselves. There's postage to this. We have to have people answer the phones and take the request. If you go to our website and order this, did you know somebody has to build this website and maintain it? And I spend a lot of money. It takes me over $5 million per month just to pay my bills. And yet I'm giving things away. Did you know to the natural mind, this is crazy. And when I first started giving things away, the reason I did that is because Jamie and I, when we first started in ministry, were poor. And it was my fault totally. It wasn't God's. I thought that if a person was called to the ministry that you had to just depend upon God only. You couldn't work a job. I didn't have the right thing. And the scripture says that if you don't work, don't eat. And so here I was ministering to two or three people in a Bible study per week. And that well, I wasn't ministering enough to live full time of the gospel. I should have been working a job, but I thought that I had to be just devoted to studying the word and praying and ministering the word. So because of it, Jamie and I were poor and we went to a meeting at Christ for the Nations where a man was preaching and he was preaching on prosperity and talking about how God wanted to bless us. And man, I needed it. We needed it. Jamie was eight months pregnant with our first child, and we had gone two weeks without any food. When I'm talking about that we were poor, some of you talk about being poor just means you have to go get a McDonald's or you have to eat some of the frozen food or a canned food that you've got and you don't have everything you want. When I say we were poor, I'm saying we had nothing. In our refrigerator, we kept a little deal of salt so that it wouldn't clump up when we lived in Texas because of the humidity. And that's the only thing that was in our refrigerator. I guess we probably had some ice in there and that was it. We had gone two weeks without eating and we went to hear this man preach on this. Man, it was changing us. I knew that it was what I needed to know. We went back to his tape table and he had all of this teaching that could have transformed my life. And I remember looking at that and I couldn't get it because we didn't have a penny. I mean, we had nothing. We actually ran out of gas on the way to that service. And I got on the side of the road and laid hands on it and prayed. And it started back up and we drove that car after it had run out of gas for a week. (laughs) I had more faith than I had money. And so we were struggling. And I remember looking at that thinking this had changed my life. And I looked over at Jamie and she had tears in her eyes. Two weeks without food, being eight months pregnant. And uh, I looked at her, and I just made a decision right then. I said, Father, if you ever show me anything that will change another person's life, I'm never going to deny them access to it because of finances. And I, at that time, didn't know that I'd ever put out anything that would help somebody else. I didn't know I was going to have a ministry and do all of these kind of things. But that's just a commitment that I made. You know, it came up out of my spirit. It didn't come to my head. It didn't make sense. How do you build a ministry that needs over $5 million per month? That's just my U.S. ministry. We got 16 foreign offices. I probably need about seven or eight million dollars a month in order to, to meet my obligations worldwide. How do you do this and give things away? Our website, you go there. We've got 200,000 hours of free material on our website. Nearly everything there is absolutely free. How do you do this and have a multi-million dollar ministry? It does not compute up here. And I've had people come and prophesy to me that I'm of the devil because I give my things away. I need to sell it. I need to start doing this. But it just came up out of my heart. It's a desire that I have. And you know what? Here we are. It's now been, man, it's probably 45, 48 years since that instance. I have given away hundreds of millions of books, CDs, pamphlets, DVDs, our website, we have over a million downloads per month free of charge. And you know what? We are prospering. 
During this pandemic, we didn't have to lay off one single employee. We didn't take any money from the government. It works. The point I'm making through all of this is this came up out of my spirit. It didn't come from my head. And yet I could name names right now. I'm not going to do it, but there's other very well-known ministers that have built their whole ministry on selling all their products, and that's fine. They can do whatever God tells them to do. But they have seen me give things away and they see that we are prospering. And I now have other very well-known ministries that if I was to call their name, you'd know who I'm talking about. And they now give things away because they're seeing that it works. I didn't learn this from somebody else. This just come up, came up out of my spirit. And this is the way that you have to relate to God. And now that I've done it, it makes perfect sense. The Bible says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. So I understand it, and now it's just become a part of the way I do things. But it came, it didn't come from my head. Matter of fact, I had everybody and their dog tell me that I was wrong and I was missing God to give so much stuff away. I've actually had people that ran my ministry who were managers for us that this was a bone of contention and they said, you've got to start selling stuff. And I had to get rid of them because it just wasn't what I had in my heart. It doesn't make sense to the natural, but man, I it works. It works. I'm saying none of these things to pat myself on the back. I'm saying that this is knowing God by the Spirit. It's functioning from the Spirit instead of from your head. And this is the very reason that most people aren't satisfied with Jesus. Not because there's any dissatisfaction in Jesus. Not that He's missed it in any area. But we are just trying to feel Him. In our physical emotions, we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to see with our physical eyes. Here, we're, we're wanting some tangible physical thing when God is a spirit. And to really connect with God, you've got to do it by the spirit. This is why praying in tongues is so important. I could get off and spend a week or two just talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. But 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14 says that when you pray in tongues, your spirit prays. When you are praying in tongues, this born-again spirit part of you that has the wisdom of God, the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16, an unction from the Holy One so that you know all things, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. In Colossians 3.10, you've been renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. That's not true up here in your little peanut brain, but in your spirit, you have the mind of Christ. And when you pray in tongues, you are praying the mind of Christ. You are releasing this supernatural wisdom. And all you got to do is say, God, what am I saying? And the scripture says, if you pray in tongues, pray also that you interpret. And God will reveal to you this wisdom. Man, it is so important. You can't really function in the spirit realm as God wants you to without the baptism of the Holy Spirit and praying in tongues. Praying in tongues is just like turning on a switch, flipping a switch and turning on this dynamo on the inside of you. It says in Jude chapter 1, verse 20, But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's talking about praying in tongues. And when you pray in tongues, you are praying on your most holy faith. And the next verse says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. When you are praying in tongues, you are keeping yourself in the love of God. You are releasing the love of God. Not just a physical, tangible feeling of love, like, you know, with your mate where you have a goosebump or something. But this is an, um, this is a spiritual emotion. I don't even know if I can say it that way, but it's, it's not tangible, but it's, it's more real. The spirit world is more real than the physical world. And you can get into a place where you release this supernatural power of God and you operate in a wisdom that goes beyond carnal reasoning. And a failure to do this is the reason that there's people watching this program right now that you aren't satisfied with Jesus. You probably wouldn't have said it that way. You're born again. You know that you're going to heaven. But the truth is you're depressed, you're discouraged, you're lonely, you're fearful because you are just operating in the physical realm. You aren't taking the Word. You aren't operating by the Spirit. 
You're operating only in the carnal realm, and that's a hindrance. Just as Philip, he wasn't satisfied with Jesus because he only knew that vehicle that Jesus was in. He was only looking at Jesus' physical body. He didn't see who the real Jesus was. You've got to get beyond the physical, and you've got to live out of your spirit. That's the real you. The reason I do what I do is twofold. First of all, God just transformed my life, and it's just like the guy that the Lord told him. He says, don't go tell anybody about what's happened to your daughter, and he, man, couldn't keep it quiet. When you get God touching you, you just want to tell somebody. You got this good news you want to tell people. But beyond that, I believe God's got a specific call on my life, and I mean, God has encouraged me thousands of times. And on November the 4th, 2014, he woke me up at three o'clock in the morning and he said, this is the reason that I've raised you up is to change people's opinion of me. And as their opinion of me changes, then they in turn will go change their world. Our partners are essential to everything we do. 53% of the people who write us and contact us don't give a thing. And we send them the material. And the reason that I give my tapes away is because back in the beginning of our ministry when we were in Seagoville, Texas, pastoring our first little church, I just made a promise. I said, God, if you ever show me something that could change another person's life, I'll never deny them access to it because of finances. The initial response that I get from people who come in contact with our ministry is that they just see God in a total different light than they've ever seen Him. That causes them to respond to God. The whole motive behind Charis is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, where Paul said, Be strong in the grace that's in the Lord Jesus, and the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. That's been my whole thrust. And when I started Charis Bible College, it was because I could see that it was a way of fulfilling those verses. Through Karis, we go deeper with people than I can do on television or through a book or through a CD or anything like that. And so what we hope to accomplish is to make disciples. And it's already happening. We've got people on every continent of the world that are reaching people. And through them, we are making an impact that I could never do. If you enjoyed today's program, you can watch this entire series and over 17 years of Andrew's TV and radio broadcasts free for you to download and share with others by going to awmi.net. awmi.net is where to find encouragement when you're discouraged. awmi.net is where to find biblical truth when you need strength. You can always count on awmi.net for sharing God's unconditional love and grace. Andrew's brand new teaching, Are You Satisfied with Jesus?, is available as a booklet. And today, Andrew would like to offer it as his free gift to you. Go to awmi.net to receive your free copy and to order additional copies to share with friends and family for only $1 each. I'd like to encourage you to get this little pamphlet. It's very short, entitled, Are You Satisfied with Jesus? We also have CDs and then we have DVDs that were taken from my television program. But I tell you, these truths have revolutionized my life. These are some of the most important things that God has ever shown me, and I can promise you that very few Christians relate to God spirit to spirit. This would help you. Are you satisfied with Jesus? This new series is also available in a two-part CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get this teaching. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. 
Call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time at 719-635-1111. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. Bring Karis with you wherever you go with our new Karis app. Free to download the Karis app allows you to easily access everything Karis Bible College has to offer in one place. Receive exclusive grace content and explore unique Karis features. Watch or listen to archived resources and teachings. Follow along with the Bible reading plan or listen to the audio Bible. The Karis app brings everything in one place. Download your app today. I'd like to encourage you to call in. And I know that God is speaking to many, many people. And you may have had the Lord touch you today. And if you just need somebody to touch and agree with you, the Scripture says, if any two of you agree touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. So we have these people, I mean powerful people who love God and are equipped in the Word of God. They're there to pray with you and help you. The number is 719-635-1111. That's 719-635-1111. This program is brought to you by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. Most of Satan's attack is your identity and you going around trying to prove who you really are. Right. Say out loud, I'm the righteousness of God. Righteousness of God. Whether you believe it or not, I'm the righteousness of God. I believe I'm the righteousness of God. Renew your mind, your spirit, renew your life at the 2020 Grace Life Conference. Check out this year's speakers you don't want to miss. Creflo Dollar, Taffy Dollar, Michael T. Smith, Gregory Diddow, and Andrew Womack. Don't miss out on this opportunity to set your life back on track. Come to the 2020 Grace Life Conference. Seats are limited, so register today. praise God. And that's what happens every time you take the truth of God's Word and put it in the ground. And you ain't got to say amen, and you ain't got to shout, and you ain't got to get up and run. But boy, if you'll just cultivate that Word and believe it, one day something's going to grow up out of you, and it's going to grow into this world, and you'll see what I'm talking about, praise God. Boy, that, that, that gets me stirred up. That, make, that gives me the truth. Give me a good praise service where we can actually meet the Lord and the presence of the Lord in the praise service. Amen. Amen. And then feed me some word. I see you later. <laughs> but if I come to church and I just have a good fun time, and then you ask me in the middle of the week, why, why was church? It was good. We had a good time. Well, what happened? What did y'all learn? Uh, uh, I don't know. It was good, though. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was real. That's a waste of my life. Yeah. All right. But if you can go to that church and get fed something and get some seed in you, and three weeks go by and something start growing, your attitude start changing. Your faith, you just can't say the negative no more because you really believe what you believe and the Holy Ghost is working in you. And you believe, I tell you what, I can stay there a hundred years because I'm renewed every time I'm in the presence of that word. Y'all excuse me, man, but nah, that's, that's it. 
So the Holy Spirit's been sent, and we know he works in us, but I believe he's working in us to convince us of all that Jesus has done. Here, here's another situation. You remember Matthew chapter 317, flip over there right quick. The real temptation for Jesus in the garden when he was uh, being led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. The real temptation for Jesus was not to turn the, was not to turn the stone into bread. That wasn't the real temptation. When he, when he said in verse 17, he says, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son, in him I am well pleased. He just said, This is my son, this is my son, and I'm pleased. But then look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3. So he, he, he goes right into this, and he says, And when the tempter came, that's Satan, to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God. Wait a minute. He just said, This is my beloved Son. And the tempter came and says, All right, if you are the Son of God, then command these stones to be made bread. For him to turn the stones into bread to prove that he was the Son of God was for him to say, I don't believe what he said when he said, This is my beloved Son. The lesson we learn from that is you ain't got to do nothing to prove to somebody what you believe. I don't need to offer you any evidence of, of my belief. I mean, are you serious? I believe God. I do not have to do something so you can believe that I believe God. I believe God. So the biggest temptation, because he knew he was a son of God, was, and here's another thing, and I can turn these stones into some light bread. Buns, rolls, I can do all of that. But I'm not going to do it. I know I'm the Son of God, and I don't need to come and do anything to try to prove to you, devil, that I know. And that's the place of attack. Most of Satan's attack is your identity, and you're going around trying to prove who you really are. Right. Say out loud, I'm the righteousness of God. Whether you believe it or not, I'm the righteousness of God. I believe I'm the righteousness of God. Shama, 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 shama. Look at one more. Hebrews 4, 15, and we'll, we'll start the teaching tonight. Hebrews 4, 15. Oh, man. He says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, I used to think, well, praise the Lord, if I'm tempted with smoking weed, Jesus tempted with smoking weed. <laughs> and there's certain things that really didn't exist back then to be tempted with. But what was he tempted with? Watch this. The temptation was, I was in all points tempted as we are. What's the greatest temptation? To walk in disbelief. What do you think that whole deal was in the garden where he was sweating blood out of his pores? It was an attack on his mental faculties to believe God. And Jesus would believe God, but he says, I was tempted like you are in every point, but I did not sin. I trust my Father. I did not sin. So, you know, some people think, Jesus was tempted? Did you read in Gethsemane all the stuff he went to? The Bible says that, that fear, fear and, dis and depression struck his soul. Yeah. He was in his human body. But rather than yield to unbelief, there's so much pressure it came out of his pores. He began to sweat blood. Man. So that just kind of tells me that it's, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, it's, I, you have to ask yourself the question. If, you're, if you look at stuff that you're doing, you now know the issue's got to be in this area of disbelief if, as a Christian. Unbelief as someone that's not saved yet. Look at everything that you're doing that you're like, I need to stop doing this, this is doing it. It's unbelief. It's got to be dealt with. 
The issue today is that we got a lot of believers that don't believe. Wow. And so in my own life, I'm thinking every time fear knocks on the door about something, I immediately ask, do you believe? And sometimes I have to pause and say, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know, God. I don't, I don't feel like I do right now. This is, this is, this is tough. This is tough. I've got a matter of hours, and I believe I, you told me to do this, and I don't, I don't know what to do. Well, can you believe me? And, and you feel so stupid when he, when he comes with this simple thing, well, can you believe me? But when you don't think belief is really a big deal, then you're always searching for something you can do rather than believing him correctly. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. This is pretty, um, this is going to really cause you to think on some stuff. Uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, 28 in the NLT. The question I want to ask you, you can answer it. I'm going to ask you one question, and I need two answers from you. I need an answer. The first answer from you needs to be, this is your answer for you as an individual. And then the second answer is, this is the answer of somebody else you've seen in this world. And the question is, is sin the central issue in life? For you and I, no. It used to be, right? For the most of the, I would even say church, for the most of the church, is sin the central issue? Yes, it is. You've come from any church, and all you've been preached to was about your sin. And you ain't going to heaven because of this, and God can't bless you because of your sin, and you can't get this because of your sin, and you and, and all, it's all, the whole issue was about sin, and you came to church because of your sin, and 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 and, and if you miss you, you were sinful, and if you if you had a miscarriage, it was it, you were sinful, and, and and it was a sin, it was a sin, sin was a problem, sin is the issue, oh sin, 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 sin is the issue with everything wrong with you, sin is why you got sick, sin is why you didn't get no job, sin is why you lost your job, it was sin, it was sin, it was sin, sin is why you. You got divorced. Sin is why the marriage didn't work. Sin is why the children didn't turn out right. It was sin. It was sin. It was sin. Now, you know what I'm talking about? All right, so that's still going on today. It's still going on today. That sin has become the central issue of life. Sin. Well, why is God not speaking to you no more? Sin. Well, how come you didn't get promotion? Sin. Well, how come things aren't working out for you? Sin. Well, why'd you get cancer? Sin. You know, you know, some of my world faith brothers, they were afraid to tell anybody that they were sick because people associated, well, you're a man of God. You got sick. You must be in sin. And then, God forbid you end up getting a divorce because it was just crazy. Oh! This your second marriage? Oh, ain't nothing going to ever work for you. That's sin. For real. And we bought it, and we were sweating, trying to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I almost quit because I'm thinking, you know them long fast we used to go on? <laughs> Starving. We was already starving anyway. We didn't need to fast. <laughs> because we were trying to be, it was a cleansing. We had to get cleansed. And it was just so tormenting. We had to literally try to shut down our humanity. You, if you were attracted to somebody, you couldn't say it, that's sin. Yeah. Yeah. I almost missed my wife because, you know, I was praying and Looked up and saw our legs, and I said, I bind you to the spirit of lust. And I, I heard from God, said, that ain't the no spirit of lust. It's me trying to show you what you pray for. Look up. But I was so sin conscious. I, I, we just, you know, for a while we thought that's just how it was. That's how it was. And I actually thought there were people who never did sin. That was a lie. <laughs> I was amazed of the people that I thought 
Never did sin? God, dog. <laughs> in the booth, in the back, in the corner, in the dark? Good. Goobie galoop. What you say, boy? <laughs> All right, now, what I'm about to show you, not just the scripture, but where I'm headed. First of all, is everybody with me? I know I'm kind of. All right. So also, Christ was offered. How many times was Christ offered? Once for all times as a sacrifice to do what? Is it on the screen? All right, Christ was offered how many times? Once. To do what? Sacrifice. To take away what? to take away sins. So the offering of Christ, his body, and his blood was offered one time to take away sins of many people. How many of you in here tonight believe what you just read? Okay. He will come again. How many believe he's coming again? But not to deal with our sins. It's a major issue to most people, but it's not an issue to God because he's, he's already dealt with it. So if he's not coming again to take away our sins, what is he coming to do the second time? To bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. See, we have made sin a major issue, but sin is no longer an issue with God because of what Jesus' sacrifice has accomplished. It's an issue with people but it's not an issue with God. Man. That was hard for me to hear. Because what I heard was, it's okay to sin. That's not what I said. What I said was, Jesus has already dealt with the sin issue. It's dealt with, done, sin meter has been turned off. Not so you can sin. Why? Because you have the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is working in you to give you a desire to do what's right. And to, to, to uh, the grace of God is still designed to bring you to holiness. So the presence of the Holy Spirit in you is not going to let you do what other people are trying to say. Amen. What they're trying to say is if sin is no longer uh, the central idea, then you're going to sin more. No. If sin is no longer the central idea, then Jesus becomes the central idea. And the more focus I give to him and believing him, yeah. Yeah. I keep, I keep, Sin is so con. I remember praying in the morning, Father, forgive me for the sins that I hadn't even done yet. Yeah. That's sin consciousness going somewhere to happen. Uh, you remember this prayer, Lord, forgive me for sins omitted, committed, known, and unknown. <laughs> God, no. Lord, forgive me for the sins I don't even know nothing about. <laughs> That's just sin consciousness. And every time somebody hears a teaching like this, they're, they're tempted with disbelief. I can't believe that Jesus has already taken care of my sin. And if you tell me to do that, and if you, tell, if you preach that, people people just going to go crazy. No, they're going crazy now. Yeah. Why? Because they don't know about the liberty that has already been given to them. And the Holy Spirit is trying to convince them, oh, yes, this is true. His body and his sacrifice one time took care of the sin issue. He is now working on your righteousness, trying to convince you that you're righteous, but you won't believe you're righteous because you're sin. Oh, what about sin? What about sin? We can hardly ever talk about anything awesome because we're, what about sin? What about sin? What about sin? And even right now, people who are watching this on stream, you probably got somebody in there, oh, that's just heresy. I ain't even worried about it. Because the E-Church, they take care of all them folks. Them trolls coming out of E-Church like, wham! And then they, they either get saved or go away or get blocked. Listen to this. As far as true righteousness is concerned, whether an action or a thought is sin is completely besides the point. The issue, whether it's an action or a thought being sin, is completely besides the point. God doesn't determine whether he is okay with me based on whether or not I am healthy or gluttonous, whether I smoke, drink, chew, or hang with those who do. God is okay with me 
because he took all my sin away and I believe it. He's okay with me because of Jesus. He's okay with me. Because, now, a person who doesn't understand grace, here's how he hears that. Well, then, we can do what we want to do. You, you, you don't have him. Grace has not yet entered into your life. Jesus has not yet entered into your life. I know you went to the prayer room, but something didn't take. Because if Jesus is on the inside of you, it's not going to be, well, I might as well go sleep with a hundred more prostitutes. You don't want it no more because you got to remember, he's working in you to give you a desire and the power to do what pleases him. He's working in you. Don't forget he's working in you. But you keep focusing on the sin issue, the sin issue. And the Holy Spirit is in you, working on the inside of you, and he can hardly do his work because Tommy give you a bath today. You think, what about sin? What about sin? He says, I got you under a continuous waterfall of cleansing. A spirit-filled life, the comforter has been sent to convince you of the sin of unbelief and disbelief, to convince you that you are the righteousness of God, not based on what you do, but based on your belief in Jesus, to convince you that the enemy has already been judged. Look at, uh, which time I got? Look at Romans chapter uh, 425 in the NLT. Romans 425 in the NLT. It keeps coming up and it keeps coming up. And I just figure, okay, if it's going to keep coming up, I'm going to keep preaching it and keep preaching it and keep preaching it until you believe that you're the righteousness of God until you believe you didn't become unrighteous when you, when you missed the mark, when you sinned. You didn't become unrighteous, you were still righteous. Remember I told you the story about when I fell in my pond? I fell in a black man, I got up a white black man, but I was still a black man. <laughs> Nothing changed. You're righteous. You're righteous today, tomorrow. Well, what about the unpardonable sin? I already told you what the unpardonable sin is. It's unbelief. Unbelief can be repented of, but it cannot be forgiven of. Write that down. To help me remember it. I'm gonna I'm gonna teach on that. Unbelief can be repented of, but it cannot be forgiven of. Why? You, you tell me. Unbelief, repent. When I use that word, it means to change your mind. It literally means to change the mind. And I'm saying that unbelief can be repented of, but it cannot be forgiven of. Explain that. You know it. You have to change your mind. And once you change your mind, you're forgiven of everything. But how can I forgive something when you don't believe nothing? So it requires a change of your mind. I can't forgive unbelief that's not repented of. And so we pick all of these scriptures in the New Testament and say, see there? That was unpardonable sin. See, that, that, there's, no, there's no, every sin is pardonable, <laughs> except unbelief because you chose to reject the pardon. You chose not to believe in the pardon. Oh, look at this, verse 25. He was handed over to die because of our sins. Now, think about the biggest waste in the world. For you to don't, don't, 
I don't believe it. He died for your sins, and you're still trying to figure out how to deal with them. Excuse my English. They done been dealt with. He died because of your sins. And you're still trying to do something to deal with your sins that's been dealt with. And he was raised to life to make us right with God. Has Jesus been raised from life to life? For what? To make us right with God. Here's the issue. Do you believe that? Ultimately, a sinful, a sin-filled life ultimately is rooted and grounded in unbelief or disbelief. Ultimately. When a man believes he is righteous, he will then do right. When a man questions his identity of righteousness, he's operating in doubt, and he will always be subject to yield to the temptations of this world. The issue is this relationship you have with God as it develops every day, as it's cultivated every day. You're going to walk in a higher level of belief, a greater level of belief, more and more believe in God, more and more believe in God. You get that word, you're planting that seed in you, more and more believe in God, more and more believe in God. Maybe you run into some rough patches and it's like, this is really hard, God, but I believe you. Help me, God. As believers under grace, the Word of God reminds us that we are no longer living under the law, but are to be led by the Spirit in all that we do. The Holy Spirit guides us and gives us a divine advantage in every aspect of our lives. If only we would receive it. If you are struggling with yielding to the guidance of your unseen partner, the Holy Spirit, or need a boost in your faith to follow Him, the five-message CD series, The Spirit-Led Life, is just for you. Receive it today for just 30 U.S. dollars. No weapon formed against you shall prosper when you put your focus and consideration on what the word says then you'll begin to be spirit led versus emotionally led you have to get today's message you guys it's so powerful it will literally change your life or you can combine this transformative series with the highly requested book the holy spirit your financial advisor this 50 dollars bundle is available today for just 40 u.s dollars call now or visit the website on the screen to order Renew your mind, your spirit, renew your life at the 2020 Grace Life Conference. Check out this year's speakers you don't want to miss. Creflo Dollar. You got to have your own relationship with Jesus. Taffy Dollar. I receive the gift of grace. Michael T. Smith. Let me give you news. You are not in the flesh. Gregory Dittow. It's the equalizer of every human being. And Andrew Womack. Being sensitive to the Lord can change your life. Your life will never be the same again. It's changed your mind, it's heart open. It's just life-changing experience. You can't miss it. Don't miss out on this opportunity to set your life back on track. Come to the 2020 Grace Life Conference at the World Dome in College Park, Georgia, July 6th through the 10th. Register by texting Grace Life to 51555 or visiting creflodollarministries.org. Seats are limited, so register today. Creflo Dollar Global Missions has fed, clothed, housed, and shared the gospel of grace and the message of biblical equality with people on every continent. And so today, we just want to take a moment to encourage you to go and check out our website and catch up on all the great missions work that is going on around the world. You may never go to these places that we've gone to or witnessed the poverty firsthand that we've seen and been to the corners and places where all these things are taking place. But you know what? Your prayers and your financial support is enabling us to impact people in these very regions where you've never been. So on behalf of the seeds that you're sowing to enable us to minister to the needs of people, we want to say thank you for caring enough to proactively take the steps to prevent misfortune in the lives of others so that we can be a blessing, so that all families of the earth can be blessed. God bless you.
Whether it's through our main campus or fellowship churches, our international offices or mission trips, every day Creflo Dollar Global Missions makes a mark that cannot be erased. To learn more about the work of Creflo Dollar Global Missions, log on to missions.creflodollarministries.org. Thank you, partners and friends. I want to let you know that we have now started a Karis Daily Live Bible Study. We've been doing a Bible study every Tuesday night live for about two years, but now we have five days a week. We've varied the times so that we can accommodate anybody's schedule, and it's going to really be good. We're going to use our instructors from the school, and it'll be a blessing. So remember, we now have a Karis Daily Live Bible Study five days a week. You know, I've got great news for those of you who've been wanting to partake of Karis, but you just can't move. You can't seem to uh, find how to fit it into your schedule. We now have what we call e on this little iPad, and you get all of the first-year courses here. There's a total of 39 courses, eight hours teaching per course. So that, I think, is 312 hours worth of teaching. It's loaded on here so that you don't have to have an Internet connection. It comes with headphones, wireless headphones, and this way you can take advantage of the first year of CARES curriculum, whatever your situation is. And you can interact with our staff. You take tests. They know where you are in this process. It's just a great way to take advantage of it. Check it out, eCARES. Watching Victory Life Today with Al and Angie Burke. Welcome to Victory Live Today. I'm Angie Burke, and thanks so much for joining us today. I have a very, very special guest with me today. This is our niece, Erica Perry. Erica, welcome to the show. Thank you We're so much for having so us. so excited to have you because I believe that you have a message that's just going to help so many people through this one particular trial that you have been through and, and maybe others after that, you know. But I just want to say that, you know, before we begin, I want you to know that trials do not come from God. God is not the author of testing you or trying you in any way. And there's a reason why trials come to us, but it's not because God sends them. So we, I want to set that up at the first, the first part of the show that just don't think God has done any of this. I want to read you in James 1.13. It says, when you're tempted, don't ever say God is tempting me. For God is incapable of being tempted by evil, and he is never the source of temptation. That's in James 1.13. So we are tested by the devil, by the world, and by our own desires. And you have to be careful about your own desires because you can end up in a real bad place if you go with them, if it's not according to God's will. So just remember that as we talk to Erica. And they're not given to us to teach us something. I mean, you know, Erica, God has many ways to teach us, and it's not through trials. He's not the author of them. And we really have to know that and believe that. And the more you know God's word, the more you'll know God's character. And that's why we really want you to get into the word of God because his character is totally opposite of bringing any problems into your life. And if you don't know the word, it's really serious because a woman had, I know a woman who had a cancer spot on her, um, on her cheek and she went to hear a prophet. And this prophet said, you know, if you want to go on with the word of, with, with God in your life, he's going to put something to, oh, and yeah. keep you there, keep it there forever. And right away she went, oh, and she 
pointed to, this is what God's given me. But the only reason why that woman feels that way and believes that is because she never opens the word of God. And she's the first one to tell you, I don't read the word of God. So, you know, it's important to get into the word. And and when you see what Eric has gone through and how she is now, you, you're going to you're going to just dive into it because it really is your only hope. So, Erica, I, um, you know, I, I want to say that, you know, people don't realize, but, well, many people do. This is something that every parent on the face of the earth does not want to go through. And some could even dread. Okay, so Erica, she lost a child. And I'm going to let you tell the story about Hannah and when she was diagnosed and with what, and we'll start there. Excellent. Thank you for having me. Sure. Um, well, Hannah, my uh, first, well, my first child, um, I was a single mom. She um, she was diagnosed with neuroblastoma. It was stage four uh, at about 19 months old. And she was given, now, um, neuroblastoma is a solid tumor cancer. And she was given a 20% chance of living if we did the, all the treatments that they recommended. With the treatments. With the treatments. 20% okay. wow. survival. And the, the treatments were pretty brutal. Yeah. So for an entire year, she went through a surgery. She went through chemotherapy. She went through radiation. And then she had a bone marrow transplant. Wow. So at that point, she was clean and clear. I remember the first time, you know, when we got the diagnosis, you were in Tampa. We were on the east coast of Florida. And yes. I just got in the car and went over there. And it was the weekend, so the hospital wasn't doing anything at that point. She was in the crib. But we, we immediately took out authority and started praying over her. You know, and you were a believer. You yes. are a believer. And yes. you understood authority and everything, too. So, okay, I just want to clear yeah, that up. No, no so problem. Go ahead. Um, six months later, after she had gone through all of, you know, she had had the year of treatment, and then six months after she was clean and clear, she relapsed in the brain. Mm -hmm. And at this point, there was a 0% survival rate. So no matter what they were going to do, if she did treatment, if not, it was like six to nine months to live. So at that point, we went to Sloan Kettering for a year and a half, um, and we did experimental treatment, which was actually um, less toxic. Mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, that that mm -hmm. is Sloan's yes. whole concept is to go less toxic away from chemotherapy and things like that. Mm -hmm. So after a year and a half traveling back and forth mm -hmm. to New York City to Sloan Kettering, she was cured of cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say maybe for a year and a half, two years clean. And then she, um, at about seven years old, mm -hmm. she was diagnosed with a um, interstitial cystitis of the lungs. And so this slowly just killed her lungs. Deteria. I know she was on oxygen yes. for a couple of years. And... Well, no, uh, from seven to seven and a half oh, when okay. she passed away. So okay. she deteriorated once she okay. she had the interstitial cystitis wow. of the lungs. And that was actually caused by the bone marrow tra transplant. Yes. Yes. So ultimately, she did not die of cancer. Right. She Amen. died of the treatment for cancer. I do. I do. I do absolutely believe. I know that her lungs had really basically collapsed and yes. she could they couldn't she couldn't survive with the life support and uh, and I remember that and uh, you know you you were like uh, quite a doctor back then you know and you know today all the medical terms and everything and but you had to and uh, and you know it was a rough rough sex six years seven years whatever and uh, I understand that but tell us a little bit about Hannah because I loved that <laughs> little girl. She was so spiritual and she had such a connection to God and she was always in a good mood and she was always happy and always believed in the right things, even at a young age. Just a little bit like, tell us, a, the, tell me, tell them the story about when she was in the back seat of the car. This is during her treatments yes. and during the hard time and, and she was amazing. She did not complain. No. She just enjoyed life and, 
And I think also we never made a thing a thing. I mean, we just were like, we're going to live our lives. We are not going to let cancer define us. Right. And that's, I mean, that was, that attitude shift was, was huge. Um, but Hannah was an angel and yeah. she did have a revelation of, of the Lord. And that was the time you're talking about. Uh, we were driving, we, we were just going down the street. So we didn't have the radio on. We weren't, you know, we, we were just kind of in the car quietly. And I look back in my rear view mirror and I could just see Hannah beaming. I mean, like it was like radiating light. And I'm like, what are you thinking about? She's like, I mean, I could just tell something was going on. Yeah. She goes, mommy, she goes, God just opened up the heavens and revealed himself to me. And I'm like, Oh my oh, gosh. I didn't even know what to she say. She had such an incredible she relationship did. with Jesus at that young age. And, and I'll tell you, Erica and I were in the kitchen one day and Hannah, she was on oxygen at this point. So she was sitting watching TV and her back was to, to us. And we were in the kitchen doing things and we must have said something that wasn't positive. And she never even turned her back to look to, around to look at us. She kept her eyes on the TV and she says, she yells out, no negativity, please. <laughs> and I could not. I mean, this girl just taught me so much, and she is just so awesome. But, Erica, I want to get to this sure. because a lot of people have lost children that, and Christians have lost children that, you know, we maybe we don't know any of them around us, but there are many. How did you feel about all this? I mean, here you were a believer. You you. You had us come and, and several times we met with you and, and took authority and you, you stood by faith and, and did you have any questions? I, did you have any questions for God afterwards? I mean, uh, well, you know, it's not an easy situation. No. I mean, thank goodness for faith, meaning I can't imagine going through this without faith. Mm. Um, I will say this, this was not God's fault. That's the first thing. Um, and, and that's why it's so import, important to know the word. I mean, this started in Genesis. And I think people forget, you know, once Eve ate that apple, that sin ushered sickness, death, disease. The devil was now loosed to rob, steal, kill, and destroy. And once I solidified that in my heart, I was like, this was the devil. This yes. is not God. Absolutely. He is getting a bad rap. So the first thing is just identifying the truth. Yeah, and this is so important because I remember before Hannah passed, way before Hannah, Erica was sitting in my kitchen and she said, she said, I know this much. She says, if Hannah doesn't make it, it's not God's fault. And I thought to myself, wow, that is a mature Christian that you would actually say that before something like that might happen. You didn't know. What about what about peace? What about fear? What about doubts through that whole time? How did you handle, uh, you know, your emotions? It's very emotional time. I, you know, I have to say, after um, thinking it through, God gave me an incredible peace. Hannah was sick for six years. I look back on that time. I was, I, I did not have fear. I did not have anxiety. I was not walking around like, oh my gosh, is this the last day? I mean, I was not, when when the doctors would give me these 0% diagnosis, 20%, you know, I, just peace would wash over me. God gave wow. me peace continually. And like mm -hmm. I said to you, there was only two days out of six years that I was out of peace. And it was... Right before she was diagnosed, I knew something in my spirit was seriously wrong. Like my spirit was very um, agitated. And agitated. it wasn't, and it wasn't a sign or anything—a physical sign that made you think that. You no, just, it was not a physical wow, sign. Wow! It, it was just—I felt like a preparation. Like things mm -hmm. are really going to change here. Like something's wow. going on. And then um, the night before she was put on life support. I, and let me tell you, I don't know how people can be out of peace. I was yeah. just pacing back and forth in my bathroom. I mean, I was, I was breaking down. I was starting to lose it. I was like, something's going on here. I, I just, I don't, I don't. And so yeah, two so, times. Yes. And I, because I lived in so much peace, I can clearly remember those wow, two days that because is really good. it was, 
so counter to what I was living. So that was a supernatural piece because there's no way we could put this piece on it. It was God's peace inside of you. Uh, and his mercy was just 100%. so... Pro wow. Wow, so that's so good. What is the scripture verse? He gives us peace that transcends all understanding. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, I have to say about Erica, I want to read you this in James. Sure. It says, for you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. Remember, the testing is not from God. And then as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. And we're going to show you what that means in this next part of the story. But let me, let me ask you. Sure. Um, how did you, how did God heal you? How did, how, what happened afterwards? Did you, were you angry at him? Were you offended at him? Did you run away from him? Did you, what, how did you handle it? Well, I, I'm not beating myself up on this because I don't think anyone who's experienced this should beat themselves up right. on, you know, your, your grieving process. But I, I did not go to God for comfort. I was like, okay, God, I'm going to take it from here. Now, I was not mad at God. I was disappointed that of things course. did not go my way. Of course. Um, and so I self, self soothed. I was a little rebellious. I mean, so I was doing things to try to fill my body to feel comforted. Mm -hmm. So I would just recommend God's already promised the comfort. Go to him for that. You right. know, so that is, that is one, one thing. Mm -hmm. And until I got back into the word, and I started just back with my relationship with the Lord, that's when the real healing took place. Yes, yes, because it's the Word of God. And I white-knuckled it for wow. two years. Yeah. You know, and I, yeah. I just wish I would have turned right to Him. So, yeah. Well, of course, God doesn't want us to look back either. And He's yeah. just glad. He doesn't see all the days you didn't spend with Him. He sees the days you do. So I love that about God. You that know, He doesn't awesome. see what you didn't do. He's just glad you're here now. And what, what I, I would like you to do is just, you know, uh, before we get into the second part, how sure. can you answer parents who have prayed, who say they have prayed, they prayed correctly, they believed, they put forth their faith, and their child did not make it. When God's word says, speak to the mountain, and you shall have it if you believe it. So what what words can you give parents? If you could look right sure. into that camera yeah, and no maybe problem. give them give them a word of encouragement? Sure. Or? Well, first of all, it's not God's fault. Um, and the second thing I would say is there's just some things we are not going to understand on on this in, on earth. And um, mm. I, I kind of held on to the scripture verse, Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And so I kind of had to put all the whys and all the confusion as to, to what, what, why did this happen? I, I learned it was just counterproductive. It was kind of a a trap trying to figure mm -hmm. this out. Yeah. And so I would just say there's just some things we're not going to understand and just don't let that suck up your energy, put that energy into the healing. That was really good, Erica, because I know a lot of people and, and God has told them there's some things you don't know. You know, a lot of people suffered uh, the loss of a child and, and God would say to them, there's some things you don't know. And, and that's exactly what you said. Okay. So if I don't know everything, then I'm going to just have to trust you. That's and and tell me what you thought about the devil in this and and Hannah and you know we lose some battles and what was yes. that thing you were telling oh, me about? Yes. Just, just tell me tell well, me quickly so we could go the, into the the devil won the battle but he didn't win the war and right. Hannah got the better deal yeah. like he he's like okay I'm gonna you know take you out here on earth but it's like she loved the Lord she is in the glory. Of God. She Enjoy. is catching butterflies. She's taking care of animals and her favorite thing, walking the runway. She's showing the best clothes. Yep. You know, she, she got the better deal. It, but what's hard is the better deal wasn't here on earth. Right. That's the, of the course. hard part. But the devil didn't win. He didn't. Amen. Amen. That is awesome. That is awesome. There's healing for Erica and there's healing for you too if you're hurting in any way because due to uh, the loss of your child. But we want to fast forward sure. now 
to your wonderful husband and two beautiful boys. And we want to focus on the younger child, Cade, and mm -hmm. when he was first born, what what things have you noticed with him? And this is all going to uh, come, come together, together in the sure. end, but just tell us a little about what was going on. Sure. Um, Cade was born healthy. Um, he he came out with something called torticollis, like his, his body was just kind of cocked and just mm -hmm. a little out of alignment. And they were like, oh, that'll just go away. It's not too bad. But then when he started walking, um, I noticed his, his feet were like one of his feet were like bent out and he really couldn't he, he couldn't okay. walk yeah. but it was very sloppy and there was no such thing as running like if right. he tried to run he right. was gonna fall down um so we spent the money we got him these foot braces and you know the doctor's like well it'll either work in a year and a half or it won't and it didn't. okay and it didn't <laughs> well, let's go on to the sure. um uh, the, the, the physical, i mean yeah. so as so that was one issue so that was one issue but as time was going on and he was approaching two, two mm -hmm. maybe two and a half, he was chronically, chronically sick. I mean, chronic sickness of um, just upper respiratory issues all the time. He could not clear infections himself. He he was having, um, we would have to do antibiotic after antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking, oh, we give him antibiotics for a week and he's better. No, we'd have to almost give him a month course of antibiotics to even get is starting of getting well. So, um, but then on top of that, I, he had, my other son had given him like a half cashew and he blew up. And so all, there was, there were allergies. So I go to the allergy doctor. So basically between all of this, he's not sleeping. He's miserable all the time. He's sick all the time. I'm starting to go to different doctors. So well, Erica, let's he, let's just stop. Uh, sure. Yeah, because we're running out of time. I okay. want to get this in. He had no immune system. It's so, basically yeah, what immunodeficient. Told you. Okay, he had no immune system. So tell me the things that they wanted to give him to heal him, so gotcha. to speak. And and you don't have to get specific. Just tell me what how it compared to Hannah. Well, what happened was everything that they were recommending for him mm -hmm. all lined up with a lot of Hannah's treatments after chemotherapy. So that was wow. my first thing that I was like, that's interesting. Yeah. And then also there was so much confusion going on in, in, with, with going to doctors and blood tests. And all of a sudden I'm like, this is really confusing. And I'm like, wait a minute. God is a God of order right. that all this is not God. And then I started to realize, I'm like, wait a minute. I think this is the scheme of the enemy. This is the same plan he had for Hannah. They wanted to give the him the same, same treatment for a different problem. Yes. And you rose up in fierce... I was mad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's good. Once, once I made the connection that this was spiritual, I was like, you took one child, you're not taking another. There you go. And That's then exactly my faith right. rose up and I was like, God, you healed Cade. Show me how to get it. You've already done it, but how do I get it? Good. How does it manifest? Exactly. How, do I, how do I manifest? And you weren't going to put up with, see, this is huge, is the anger. You were not going to put up with the same trick. The devil tried, he doesn't come up with new tricks. I know. He I was not impressed. Not. <laughs> I was it. <laughs> That's very good. That's very good. I was, and I was mad. I was like, this is your best? I'm like, That's, you're not even creative. Wow. I mean, I was, yeah. Yeah. Um, so through a series of different you know, really just like you just said, okay, God, I want this and you got to help me. I did. Me. So I stopped. Yeah. There I, you go. I stopped everything. I said, we don't need any more blood tests. I don't need any more of your bad reports. I don't need any more of you telling me you don't know what's wrong and that you need to do all this stuff. Right. I said, I'm done. Thank you. So I went home, talked to my husband. He goes, I agree. So I said, good. All right. Oh, that's important. So yeah, that is very important. So we, um, we just decided to stop. And we were going to wait on God's plan. Good. And the plan didn't happen the next day. Right. It did take a couple weeks. Yeah. And then I was put in touch. I mean, remember, now these people wanted to do surgeries on on mm -hmm. Cade. Mm -hmm. You know, he they, he had these immune issues. Then he had stuff as if he was having chemotherapy, mm -hmm. the way his system was working. So I was like, all right. Friend comes to me. She's like, "Hey, I got this chiropractor for yeah, you. That's I think this will. This will. I think this will work for you. I, I think this will help Kate." So I was like, "What do I have to lose?" I went to her. 
she made a big difference. Within a couple of weeks, he was running. Wow. He was running. Wow. She unlocked his ankles. He's running. And what about the immune system? Because Well, then she ended led up, you. she led me, once I had good trust with her, right. she led me to a holistic doctor right. who put him on a complete anti-inflammatory diet. And he wasn't sick anymore. Oh, he was wow. not wow. sick anymore. Wow. And in, in the winter, so I started this in the winter when everybody's really sick. Yes. He did not get sick. And then uh, another lady from church randomly just said, hey, I know you've been going to this ENT. I have a really good recommendation for one. And instead of this ENT that she recommended me wanting to cut all of his body parts right. out, she gives him a nose spray. Nose spray. <laughs> It Do you clear, see that? I know. Those, God is so, so good. It was basically a chiropractor, a diet, and no spray. Oh my so, gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. From chemotherapy <laughs> treatments. Oh oh my like immunoglo- I mean, I was you know, just let, like, let, let me just say something. You know, we're not, we're not putting doctors down. Okay. No. Because they are operating in the way they learned. Okay, and you know, so you can't really, and and a lot of their diagnosis may be very true, and a lot of their treatments may be very right, but we've got something that trumps that. Why put our kids through that when we could do this? You know, now, if you go through things like that, God will be with you and help you, but Erica chose to stop, and that's the hard part, because now you're waiting, and you're waiting for God to lead you, and he did, and he sent you these people, but he couldn't do it as, as long as we're on this track, you know, and this is the way I want to go. He can't God's work. over here going, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. But anyway, uh, so how is Kay today, just quickly? He is amazing. Super. The energy is off the charts. Yes. He had no energy. Uh, believe me, I know. <laughs> <laughs> he is sleeping through the night. He was not sleeping through the night for years because he was just constantly clogged up. Yes. Uh, he is just a bright child. He is well. He is so smart. It is awesome. And you know what? It doesn't matter what the tests say. Meaning like Very he's just good. well. That's right. He's well. And he's acting well, so he's well. That's right. And even if you and so you don't know if he still has zero immune system because you're not going back. You That's just correct. see a well child. And it's like, why go back to have the world confirm again, nothing wrong with doctors, but that even if it comes back zero again, yes, you're but it still could create some fear and unbelief and man, you've got the proof of the pudding right there in front of you. And he is, he is very smart. I mean, I had a conversation <laughs> with him this morning that was, I mean, he's just like, don't you understand? He's five. He's five. Don't you understand? I call Sam 65. He's five. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I do, Kate. You know? He is just amazing. But I, but I do want to read a scripture to sure. everybody because this is how I want to tie this in. First Peter 5, 8, 9. It says, be sober and watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him firmly in the faith, Amen. knowing that the same afflictions are experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. She was sober. She was vigilant. And that's what's going to get uh, people who just to... Um, well, okay, I'll have to, I'll have to do this. God will be with me. And that's true. But you saw, you were able to see beyond the natural that this was the enemy coming around doing the same, same thing, thing to, to one of your other children. And you were not going to have it. I mean, you know, I always tell people you could have as much of God as you want and you can have him as fast as you want, but it's up to you. Are you going to make this decision? Are you going to be angry? You know, er- Erica's got a kind of a, you know, feisty attitude like I do, but, but it's good. It comes in handy. I'm telling you, whether you're passive or not, you need to be mad at the enemy yes. for trying to attack and be sober and vigilant and watch. And when he attacks, you attack right back. Oh, Erica, it was such a pleasure having you. Yes. And I really believe that we're, we're, we've helped a lot of, uh, parents who are dealing with such a such a tragedy and so remember that god loves you and he has the same plan for you and 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 the devil is going to try to test you and attack you and be just like erica was just sober and vigilant this may happen once but it ain't going to happen again i will not have this happen to my child and i thank thank you erica so much for coming because i really believe you freed a lot of people today. Thanks so much for joining us. And remember, victory is always yours through Jesus Christ. We'll see you next time. There's
struggles in life that we just cannot understand. And losing a child is one of them. If you are grieving the loss of a child or grandchild, there is nothing I could do or say to ease that pain. But I know who can. Your Heavenly Father has not forgotten you. Not for a moment. I would like to pray for you. Father, thank you that death has been defeated because of the cross. I pray for every single parent, grandparent, or guardian who is grieving the loss of their child. Thank you that with the enemy meant for evil, you will turn around for good. Holy Spirit, fill their void, ease their pain, strengthen their hearts, and bring great comfort to each of them. Reveal your unconditional love like never before and bring to remembrance that awesome day when they will be reunited with their precious ones. In Jesus' name, amen. Want to dive deeper into the Word, but your busy schedule robs you of that opportunity? Now you can listen to the Gospel Truth wherever you go with the Gospel Truth radio app. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we are broadcasting the gospel, not only our individual television programs, but we've got conferences on there, and it's great. No matter how your time is divided up each day, now you can plug into the gospel truth 24-7 at your convenience. It's a great way to stay connected in a world that demands so much of your time. Tap the app and start listening to Gospel Truth Radio. Go to the App Store and type in Gospel Truth Radio and download it to your smartphone. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're watching our Gospel Truth TV. I tell you, this has been a blessing. You know, if you are being touched by these programmers that we have on here, I would encourage you to support them. Did you know we don't charge any of the programmers? If you appreciate that, I encourage you to be a part of it. Join us, support Gospel Truth TV, and also support the programmers. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. We have a better covenant upon better promises, and we have a better relationship with God. All these things we strive for and work for and hope for and pray for, we already have those things because Jesus gave it all to us. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to teach on prayer. I've entitled this teaching, A Better Way to Pray. I have this book out on it, and it would really bless you. Uh, this is my third week of teaching on a better way to pray. In the first two weeks, I basically was shocking people, just talking about what prayer is not, and countering so many misconceptions that people have about prayer. And then on our program yesterday, I started talking about what prayer is. And I was basically trying to say that the primary purpose of prayer is for fellowship, relationship with God. Now, that's not the only purpose of prayer, but that's the primary purpose of prayer. And if you ever get things out of order, if you ever get to where every time you come in before God, like I've known people like this, that every time they start to pray, their voice has to just get to where it's breaking and they're crying and, oh, God, and, and it has to be pleading and it has to be this impassioned thing and stuff. I'm not saying, I know that this may rub some of you the wrong way. I'm not saying this to hurt you, but I'm saying if that's the way that you are, if your whole voice changes, if you get to where you're nearly in the... You know, your voice is breaking. You're just on the verge of tears and all of these kind of things. I'm saying it in love, but that's just a hypocrite. Now, again, there might be some times that you are feeling something and that it would be appropriate to do that. But I'm saying prayer, it, it ought to be just fellowship. You know, if you come and talk to me, how would you talk to me? Do you automatically start using Elizabethan English? 
Do you start saying, thou knowest that all uh, this? If that's not the way you would talk to me, why do you talk to God that way? We have so many religious traditions. And I'm telling you, we, we have modeled our prayer after all of these things. And I don't believe it is really connecting with God. I think I've already used this example in the very beginning, but it really bears repeating that when I first got started seeking the Lord, I knew I needed to spend time with the Lord because prior to that time, I'd just done my own thing. Now, I became aware of God and I was aware that, man, there was so much that I was missing. And so I use prayer as a discipline. If you discipline yourself to pray an hour a day or two hours or whatever it is, and if it's a discipline, I think that's okay. But if you do it in order to say, oh, God, I need you to do something, and so I'm going to pray an hour, and that will make you obligated to me. You are going to have to move in my life because I've prayed so long, and I've done this. I know you probably wouldn't put it in those words, but that's exactly what many people think. They think that if they do this, then God is obligated to do that, and they use prayer not as a way of fellowshipping and loving the Lord and relating to Him, but they use it as something to manipulate Him, to get leverage like a pry bar and move God, and they are going to move God through their prayer. I'm telling you, that attitude is wrong. That is wrong. That is not the purpose of prayer. I believe that the primary purpose of prayer is just relationship and fellowship with God. It's just so that you get to know Him, so that you're in His presence, so that you're listening to Him. He's listening to you. You are conversing. It has to be a two-way conversation. And there's just so many people that prayer has become this religious thing. So back in the beginning, I started disciplining myself, and it wasn't easy. I remember the first time I thought, I'm going to pray an hour I went for a long time, and I thought, man, I must be at least half an hour by now. And I looked at the clock, and I'd been less than five minutes. I mean, it was hard when I first started doing it because I was just so used to doing things my own way, thinking my own thoughts, and not being conscious of God. And, but I disciplined myself. It was good for me to just make myself focus on God. But it became a ritual. It became a legalistic thing. And I gave this testimony, I think, already, but I know not everybody watches every single day. But one time I would get up and pray like from 7 till 9 o'clock. And one time I was in the Word and I was reading. And as I was reading, I was praying. I was in communion with God. You know, I used this verse earlier out of Psalms chapter 5, verse 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. When you are meditating on the Lord, when your mind is focused on Him, you're reading Scripture, or you're just daydreaming, thinking about Him. God, what do you want me to do? Father, thank you for this beautiful day and things like this. And you're just meditating and thinking on God. That's prayer. And anyway, I was studying the Word, and God was speaking to me, and I was getting some great things out of it. And I looked at my watch, and it was like, uh, I don't know, it was a quarter till seven or something. It was uh, soon I was going to have to go in and spend my two hours of prayer. And when I saw that, I just thought, God, I, I know that you know what I'm thinking anyway, so I might as well say it. And I just told him, I said, Father, I'm sorry, but I get to dreading this two hours of prayer by about 645. I start dreading it. And the Lord spoke to me, and he says, don't worry, Andrew. He says, I start dreading it at 6.30. <laughs> and you know, when I realized that, hey, God wasn't enjoying this, I wasn't enjoying this quote-unquote prayer time, I thought, if God's not enjoying it, if I'm not enjoying it, why am I doing it? And you know, I quit forcing myself to pray a certain length of time. Now, again, there may be, in some cases, benefit to you setting a clock and you just forcing yourself, disciplining yourself to keep your mind not go someplace else and do anything else. But that should be, I mean, it, it might be something you do for a brief period of time to help discipline yourself. But that certainly is not what prayer is. Prayer is not just spending a certain amount of time and you going through your prayer list and doing all of these things. It's about communion. It's about relationship with God. It's, and I, I've heard people call it conversational prayer, where you just talk to God. You talk to God the way you'd talk to me. 
with a lot more reverence, a lot more respect, a lot more faith and all those things. But I mean, you don't change your whole personality. You don't immediately go to speak in Elizabethan English. You just talk to God. And actually, I believe, you know, the scripture over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, pray without ceasing. I think that there's two ways you can interpret that. One of them is that once you pray for something and you set your faith that, Father, you've provided this and so I receive it in name of Jesus. I don't believe you ever back off of that prayer. You don't ever undo that prayer. You don't counter that prayer. You pray and you don't quit until you see the manifestation of what God has promised you. That's one way to interpret that pray without ceasing. But another way is that, you know, you can't be praying 24 hours a day, but you can be meditating, fellowshipping with the Lord in your heart 24 hours a day. I mean, 24 hours a day might be an extreme, but during my sleep, you know, this last, um, last night, I was dreaming. And I mean, in my dreams, I was talking to the Lord. And the Lord was speaking to me and I was speaking to the Lord. I mean, in my sleep, I'm constantly thinking about the Lord during my waking hours. I never do anything that I'm not thinking about the Lord. I am constantly in communion. I think that's one way that you can interpret this pray without ceasing. Now, I do not believe that you can have just these special times where you are shut up and you're on your knees or you are just pouring out your heart to God and you got your hands lifting, your eyes closed. You can't be doing that 24 hours a day. You can't do that while you're driving down the road. Hopefully you, you have your eyes open and you aren't just thinking about other th things. You got to be focused on driving. I'm not saying that you can't meditate, but you can't be in this intense type of prayer all of the time. But if you look at prayer as just relationship with God and fellowship with God and keeping your mind stayed on God, and listening to him and sharing with him what you are thinking and, and your questions you ask. And if you're doing that, you could pray without ceasing. And I believe that that is one of the dominant ways that we need to pray. You know, I've already said some of these things at the beginning. I won't go back through all of this, but I've had people who focused on you got to pray an hour a day. Come and ask me, how many hours do you spend in prayer? And when they asked me that, the Lord just spoke to me and he said, how many hours did you spend with Jamie yesterday? Well, I spent all day with her. We were together all day long. How much time did we talk together? I don't know. I, it would be hard for me to condense it. I did other things. I wasn't just standing right there talking to her and in conversation the whole time, but we were together all day long. And even when we weren't talking, if we were sitting down and reading or something like that, we were aware of each other. If she would have needed something, if she wanted to say something, I was there listening and stuff. And I just think that for you to say, well, I spend an hour a day praying, that is a terrible prayer life because God is with you 24 hours a day. And yet you're only going to have an hour that you pray. And I suspect that during that hour, you got your prayer list you're going through. It's a monologue. You're telling God all of these things. You're begging and pleading for things that he's already accomplished. And there's not that much interaction and influence from God on your heart. But you call that a great prayer life. I tell you what, I think the person who doesn't spend any time just shut up and forced to pray with the clock going or something like this. But a person who is just in tune with the Lord and keeping his mind stayed on the Lord and he's listening and responding and you're with him all day, I think that is a much better relationship. Again, I go back and apply this to my wife. There are times that, you know, we have, I don't know, a problem between us. My wife and I get along great, but there have been times we've disagreed on things, and there's times that we need to sit down and talk things out, and we are looking at each other face to face, and it's intense. And you have those times, and you have other times that we're laughing and talking about things, and there's all different kinds of ways that we relate but, you know, one of the things that really blessed me when Jamie and I got together, every girl I'd ever dated prior to that time, I felt like I had to entertain them. I felt like if there was a lull in the conversation that it was a negative thing. But with Jamie, we were just so relaxed around each other. We were so one that we could drive someplace and not talk for an hour and just have an awesome time just being with each other just sitting beside each other, just looking at each other sometimes. We didn't have to talk. We didn't have to do something. I didn't have to perform. 
And you know what? When I saw that, I thought, man, this is different than any other relationship I ever had with any other girl. And that's one of the things I said, man, I believe this is God. God has just put us together. And there was a unity. And anyway, I could spend a lot of time talking about that, but I believe that this is the kind of thing that God desires with us. He just wants you. He wants relationship with you. He wants fellowship with you. And we have turned prayer into something like a grocery cart where you just go up and down the aisles of heaven saying, gimme, gimme, gimme. My name is Jimmy. My middle name is more. Gimme more. And it's just, you're always asking something. Again, I go back to the logic that I was using on our program yesterday. Adam and Eve didn't have anything to ask for. They didn't have anything to pray for. They didn't have anything to rebuke or to bind. There were no needs. And yet they met with God in the cool of the evening. And what did God make them for? Well, it says in Revelation 4.11, For thy pleasure they were and are created. That means the original purpose and still what God wants out of you is just relationship with you. He wants you. He wants time with you. Now, there is a place to be asking for something. There is a place to repent of what you've done wrong. There is a place to intercede for other people, but it is not the primary place. It is not the main thing. We need to keep the main thing the main thing, and prayer is primarily just relating to God. You know, my own personal preference, I'm not going to be able to show you a chapter and a verse that says this, but my own personal opinion is that 90% or more of our prayer life ought to be just worshiping and thanking God, loving God, telling Him how much we appreciate what He's done, reminding ourselves of His goodness and just saying thanks. You know, there is a prayer of thanksgiving and that is prayer. There is a prayer of praise where you're just praising God not only for what He's done, that would be thanksgiving, but you are praising Him for who He is. Just praise, talking about, God, you're awesome. I love you. Thank you so much for what you've done. There ought, I believe that that ought to be the majority of your relationship with the Lord. And there's many, that's the way that David prayed. And there's a lot of prayers that talk about, you know, uh, praise God in the sanctuary. Praise Him with the timbrel and harp. Praise Him with the stringed instruments and dances. There's just so many scriptures that are talking about praise and how you enter into the presence of God, which is what prayer is all about. If you aren't connecting with God, if it's just a monologue, if you're spitting out these things and saying all of these things, but if you never say over and give God an opportunity to speak to you, then I'm not sure that it's true prayer. Did you know that the Muslims pray, the Buddhists pray, the Hindu pray, all types of people pray, and yet I can guarantee you that is not connecting with the Lord, and I know that there's probably some people taking offense at that, but Jesus said, no man comes unto the Father talking about God but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man. No man, no religion, no Hindu, Buddhist, Islam, anything. Nobody approaches God except through Jesus. So if you are going through these rituals, and I don't care if you're putting a mat down and praying towards Mecca five times a day, if you aren't doing it in the name of Jesus, you are not connecting with God. And there's people, there's religious Christians that even though they may be born again, they aren't any more connecting with God than the person who prays towards Mecca five times a day or whatever because you have your own thing, you're going through your own rituals, and there's no interaction with Jesus. You've got to have relationship with God. It's all about relationship with God. I had a man recently come to our Bible college, and he has built a ministry on many different things, but prayer is one of the important parts. I'm not against that. He has prayer rooms. He has prayer going 24 hours a day and doing all of these things. And he was talking about how he disciplines himself and he prays so much per day. Again, I don't know him well enough to say yay or nay, whether that's right or wrong. But I can tell you, there are many people who go through all of those motions and yet it doesn't seem to impact them. I actually had a woman. She was at one of my meetings. And this woman, we were singing, and uh, this is back before I was on television. Jamie was leading the praise and worship, and I was at the back running the sound 
for the thing. And she didn't know who I was because I was only on radio. And so she didn't know who I was. And she was standing right in front of me and she had her hands up and she was trying to praise God. But she had a little girl with her and this little girl was trying to pull on her skirt and say, mama, mama, mama. And this girl, this woman just ignored her. And finally, the little girl just, you know, got her attention. Mama, she was pulling on her skirt. And this woman just reaches back and slaps her daughter right across the face. And she said, shut up, kid. Can't you see I'm worshiping God? And then she goes right back to this. And you know what? She was not in communion with God. If you were in tune with God, you would never turn around and slap your kid across the face and say, shut up, kid. I'm worshiping God. There are some people that they have their devotions and they go through their rituals and stuff. And then when they get out of their devotion time, they can be as mean as a snake. They will lie and represent things. And I'm just telling you that that's, that's not pleasing to God. That's not what God wants. And I there's so many people, again, all of these religions that pray and it's not doing them any good. They're out killing people in the name of Allah. That's not God leading them to do that. And yet they are very religious. That's not God. We've got Christians that are quote unquote religious and it's not God. Prayer is just about relationship with God. And again, there may be a time that you need to discipline yourself and just force yourself to keep your mind. Your mind is similar to a muscle in a sense that if you never use it in a certain direction, it can atrophy. If you've never spent time in the presence of God, if you've never prayed, you may need to set a clock and just force yourself to stay in there and refuse to watch TV, refuse to listen to something else and just keep your mind stayed on the Lord. And you might need to do it to build yourself up. But I'm telling you, prayer is about a two-way relationship, about communion with God. And if you aren't connecting with God, if you aren't hearing from Him, then it's not true prayer. You not only need to speak to Him, but you need to have Him speak to you. Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. And you know what? You need to be still. There was a time a few years back where I woke up and in, in my dream, I had this banner just come up that said Psalms 46.10. And it was so startling that it woke me up out of a dead sleep. And I have quoted that verse hundreds, maybe thousands of times. I should have known what it said, but it's just like I lost it for some reason. And so I got up and I went and looked up Psalms 4610. It says, be still and know that I am God. And it was such, it was impacted me so much that that day I just decided I was going to be absolutely still. Now, I don't believe that that is limited to talking about not moving or something. I believe it can talk about just withdrawing from your daily activity and focusing on the Lord and doing things. There's a lot of ways that you could apply it. But just to make sure I didn't want to miss anything, I went out. This was in the summer. I sat on my deck in a chair, and I mean, I sat still, and I didn't even move except my eyeballs for over an hour. I was so still that I had a deer walk up and look at me right in the face. And because I wasn't moving, it just, I don't know, it came right up to me. I had chipmunks come climb up my leg and sit on my leg. And I was still. And I was just wanting to know, be still and know that I am God. And one of the things that came out of that, did you know I heard the wind blowing through the trees? The wind blows through my trees all of the time. But I was too busy to really notice, pay attention. I noticed these chipmunks. I noticed deers. I could hear birds as they flew by. You could hear their wings flapping. And I guess I could, it was always available, but I just wasn't listening for it. I, I noticed that there was thousands of ants everywhere. And I guess they were always around, but I was too busy to pay attention. One of the things that I got out of that was just to notice things that were there all along, but I was so busy. I was doing other things that I wasn't paying attention. And I mean, my awareness of everything around me just became really pronounced. And I believe that in prayer, there are times that we need to do that. And instead of just a monologue where we are talking constantly and God can't get a word in edgewise, there's times that you need to sit before the Lord and say nothing and just listen and just find out what he wants to say to you. 
I believe that's prayer. I believe that just sitting there and not having your mind on something else, but focusing on the Lord. God, what do you want to say? Here I am. Like Ananias in Acts chapter 9, he said, Ananias, and Ananias said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Most of you probably don't have that underlined in your Bible. But boy, God spoke that to me, and he said, How many times have I wanted to talk to you, Andrew, and you weren't there? You were someplace else. You weren't listening to me. Man, it's good just to sit there and be still and know that he's God and listen. Anyway, I'm just getting started. I got more to share, but I've got this book entitled A Better Way to Pray. Also, we've got this study guide and our CDs and DVDs. These things would really help you. I encourage you to please get hold of this. I believe that this is an area that could transform your life. So listen to our announcer. He's going to give you information about all the product and how you can get it. And I encourage you to listen and then please call or write today. Andrew's complete teaching titled, A Better Way to Pray, is available as a book in either English or Spanish. Today, Andrew would like to offer this book as his free gift to you. Go to awmi.net to get your copy today. This offer is limited to one free book per household and is only available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. A Better Way to Pray is also available as a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast and as a companion study guide. Each of these